The Production Report Story Introduction The Production Report Story was an unplanned story from beginning to end. While I was writing it, I refused to have any narrative intent until the moment that I started typing a given day's entry. Any other writer who reports that a story was unplanned from beginning to end is lying. A writer's mind is always active, on many levels, sometimes simultaneously. A writer's unexpected and spontaneous project idea might have been unplanned at its beginning when the author first sat down to sketch out the opening sequence or write out a sentence, a scene which flashed through his or her mind, but during the process of writing the rest of the story, the writer's mind is furiously thinking, most often about the story that it is helping to create. So, serious plot elements occur to the writer, thematic images, subplots, and concerns for pacing, tone, and diction continuously develop and desire to be placed. By the time a writer is halfway through the writing of a so-called unplanned story, the story's denouement is firmly in the author's mind. But the production report story was different. It began to occur by accident, almost. I say that it was almost accidental because, as a writer, it is quite natural that I should eventually tell a story instead of sending a blank email. It didn't actually have a storyline until three and a half months after I started writing it. Even when it did develop a storyline, the beginning story, as I now call it, which doesn't actually start until page 33 in this edition, was so loosely defined an existential crisis that any manner of antics, related or unrelated, were still permitted. Most of the full episodes which occurred in the first three months were quoted movie scenes, one of the several reasons that this story is unpublishable. The number of legal permissions that would be required for a lawyer to think twice before running into a courtroom with a copy of it in one hand and a noose in the other would be insurmountable. But I will admit freely that several of the complete and accurately quoted movie scenes from Terry Gilliam's Brazil, Blazing Saddles, The Fifth Element, The Wizard of Oz, Ghostbusters, and of course Monty Python's The Holy Grail, were emailed to my work email from my personal email account the night before the episode was written to ensure accurate quoting. But that's the extent of planning that was possible with the storyline. It wasn't until the middle story, Crossing the Bridge of Death, which begins after the arrival of Dogbird at page 79, that I realized I was following a clear agenda which I needed to adhere to in my story's events. But since the story was based on events which were occurring out around me while I was writing it, I could no more plan my story's events than I could control the actions of people around me. The success of the so-called conflagration depended on the platypus's ability to pass the intelligence test, and that depended on the exception-based processing technique passing its test of accuracy and functionality, as well as eventually receiving corporate approval. If our reconciliation of process failed its test or didn't receive corporate approval, then the platypus would not be able to pass his intelligence test. Each episode was created on a different day, which creates a vastly different experience in emails seeing only one episode at a time than seeing the sequence of episodes in a book. It is much like the difference between watching a miniseries on TV, waiting a whole week between episodes, and watching that same series on a DVD, watching the whole season in one sitting. When I moved into what is now called the end story, Escaping the Langoliers, which starts on page 102, I began to appreciate the problems of readability in, a, in the serial nature of my story. However, I could not go back and edit my previous entries to enhance the readability. One criticism that I received while I was writing it was, I can't follow the story because I am not in the environment which is the story's context, the workplace you can't claim to be describing with it. This divide between the story and its context is even more widened when that format of business emails is removed from the text, and each episode is presented in a linear sequence of however many entries will fit on a page, instead of one episode per page. Allegorically, the story is a betrayal of the development of a reconciliation process for the accounts receivable department of a global corporation, and the inter-office politics and competitiveness surrounding that process. One way to understand the story is to be told the reference for the characters and what aspect of the work environment they represent. The Slug 
represents the escheatment process, which was incredibly slow because it was performed in the mainframe system. I recall making the joke when asked how to do escheatment, you just get in your escar and escheat. The Mountain. Shortly after we were introduced to escheatment, the senior finance manager came to me and asked me to compile a list of all the customer payments that were mismatched in amount from the invoices they were remitted to pay. The list was enormous, and I gave, and I was then burdened with the task of identifying which payments were encoded for the correct amount, as shown on the face of the check, but were deposited by the bank for the incorrect amount, and which ones were encoded for the incorrect amount in our system, but were deposited by the bank for the correct amount. The Swamp represents a research project in seeking misrecorded payments on our mainframe system, especially multiple payments with the same reference number. It provided data similar to the content of the mountain, but was requested by somebody outside of the reconciliation team. The lockbox. The new accounts receivable environment would direct all payments straight to the bank without the company encoding them first. Our reconciliation process previously compared our encoding of the payments against the bank's record of deposit and against the record of transmitting them into the accounts receivable system. But with the lockbox, the only record of payments would be the bank's record of deposit. The green stuff. One of the reconciliation processes which was being considered in which the bank's record of transmitting the checks into the company's accounts receivable system, a daily file called the POBIL, P-O-B-I-L, was sent by the bank each day, was to be considered the basis of payment research and this reconciliation would not even compare the bank's record of deposit. The platypus. The other reconciliation process being considered, in which the record of deposit from the bank would be imported into the database along with the record of transmitting those payments, and the two lists would be compared to each other. Only the items which didn't match would be researched. This is what is known as exception processing. All the other characters in cameos are based within the story, and their interactions with the allegorical characters represent the testing of the reconciliation processes for effectiveness and functionality, along with the competitiveness among the persons presenting those processes. While I was writing it, I called it the fable, and at one point, February 27th of the first year, I wrote a brief justification containing three points which I intended to interpolate into later episodes. 1. Happiness is not always the result of a well-placed joke. Workplace efficiency is not a guaranteed consequence of mirthful frivolity. Good collaboration can come from shared experiences and common roots, but sharing experiences can become a distraction if pursued too exuberantly, and an appreciation of common roots can become a source of divisiveness if taken too seriously. Your fable, as you call it, is nothing but a frivolous diversion to its audience, but it has irreplaceable value in the workplace. Two, in any single-minded endeavor, its pursuance may become numbed by the tedium of their responsibilities and perhaps might eventually run away in exasperation, screaming at the top of their lungs. This reaction would be an extreme form of frivolous diversion from which one would hope to return but is usually unwelcome to do so. The, weak, the weakness of your fable is that it could be seen as a small-scale form of running away screaming, but its value is that it involves neither running away nor screaming. 3. In any multifaceted endeavor, its pursuance may become isolated in their portion of the intricate processes and betray ignorance and even intolerance of their co-workers' responsibilities. Others who are asked to mend the resulting problem may propose alternative activities intended to reduce stress as a solution to the problem. Your fable reveals, through allegory, the relationships between the various processes as well as the nature, through personification, of each individual process involved in that interaction. Words like internecine come to mind while talking about this. September 1st. In his achievement news, I report nothing. September 5th. As for his achievement, I report nothing again. September 6th. In his achievement, we are stagnating in the muck of inactivity. September 8th, I have nothing but hope to report for his achievement. September 11, his achievement is saying nothing, patiently sitting there with a smug look on its face, as though waiting to ambush its wary audience. September 12th, 
The nothingness which eats at its achievement leaves it alternating between wallowing in abject misery and languishing in the gutters of despair. But tomorrow I forecast more rain, which is actually a blessing for the flora which buries its roots in the idle soil of the puddle which its achievement lies under. September 14th. Its achievement has nothing to say again, but shrugs dejectedly. September 18th. The slug turns its eyes upward to the sun and muttered something resembling, ho huh, huh? It might have been a sneeze. September 21st. Its achievement is gasping for air after the workout we gave it yesterday. I've never seen a snail run that fast. It's an odd sight. September 27th. Its achievement is slumbering under the weeded gardens of UAC patting its bloated stomach and belching lazily from the eating binge it has recently finished. October 2nd. Its achievement is currently shopping for new running shoes during its spare time. October 3rd. Its achievement is shopping for a jogging suit to match the running shoes it has just purchased. Color coordination is important to blurringly fast snails. ARC's ENCODE variants will soon be a reportable activity. We have to find something to keep the snail busy in order to keep the auditors off our backs. October 4th. A sheepman, wearing color-coordinated jogging suit and running shoes, is cowering in the shadow of a newly formed mountain, which shall be named ARC's ENCODE variants. A sheepman whispered it, whimpered at the mountain, I have no numbers for you today. A voice from the crest of the mountain bellowed out, Fear not, loathsome insect! I have plenty of numbers, and the achievement slug soiled its new jogging suit in terror. P.S. Wait, if the achievement is a slug, how can it wear shoes? Okay, one shoe, but it's a really, really big shoe. October 6th. A achievement is tightening its laces on its running shoes while sneering at the top of Arcs and Code Rain's mountain, whispering, Just wait until those auditors are gone. I'll show you what performance can be like. October 9th. It's cheapment. All those years they told me you are a slug. You cannot win a race. But I bought some fancy running shoes. Well, I can't wear a pair, but it's one really big shoe. And I trained long and hard. I starved myself and drank sports drinks until I resembled a lowly earthworm. But when race day arrived, I was ready. Arxenko drinks. I towered over everything. When I was told that there would be a race... I said, who can beat a mountain? And then they told me that my opponent was a slug. I laughed. As the judges tallied the results of the race, everyone watched with bated breath. Some even held their breath. Oh wait, Smurfs are already blue in the face. For his achievement, XXX items for XXX dollars. And there was much rejoicing. Yay. For XR code variants, for ARCs and code variants, XXX items for XXX dollars. John Henry high-fived the mountain. Smurfs around the world exhaled in unison and retained their natural skin color while the foliage around them flourished from the sudden availability of carbon dioxide. October 11th. In Willie's metrics, I am reporting X days out of our SLA, no history, and in sporting news... Dot, dot, dot. After a bitter trouncing recently, the mountain has come back from behind to defeat the slug in a photo finish. Arcs and Code Rain's research reported a mere X items worth XXXX thousand XXX dollars, while its achievement reported a whopping X thousand XXX items worth XXX thousand XXX dollars. A respectable performance, but not strong enough to beat the mountain's high dollar touchdowns. October 20th. A statement reports an erosion of X thousand XXX dollars. He heard the mountain use the ref word in reference to a common problem of aging. October 24th. The mountain boasted XXX open lines worth X million XXX thousand XXX dollars, January only, with XX items completed worth XXX thousand XXX items, dollars, sorry. Meanwhile, its achievement reported continuing erosion of totaling negative X thousand XXX dollars. I feel like someone is pouring salt on me, he said. October 25th. The mountain silently shrugged in its non-productive listlessness. The slug shrieked, Ha! Ah, it burns! as XX thousand XXX dollars sizzled off its hide. Well, what do you call the skin of a shell-deprived snail? Butter sauce is not the correct answer. October 26th. 
The mountain erupted with XX items worth XXX thousand XXX dollars, while the slug eroded X thousand XXX dollars. I'm feeling much better now, he said as he put on his Nike Air Jordan shoes, chew, and began to unfold his smelly jogging suit. I think I'll go for a walk. November 1st. The slug reported a less erosion of X thousand XXX dollars, but voiced concerned about concerns about possible scalp damage. The mountain reported a measly X items worth XX thousand XXX dollars. Several people approached the slug in wonder. I hear that you are an all-powerful creature, that your foot has no peer in all the world. The, sh the slug shrugged and said, I can accomplish a few things. The people tried to trick the slug by saying, If you are so powerful, then bid the mountain to come and stand at your foot. The slug called out, Mountain, come stand at my foot. The mountain snickered, Yeah, right. The slug spoke to the people, If the mountain will not come to the slug, then the slug will go to the mountain. Bring a deck of cards. This might take a while. November 6th. GL1105 research suddenly sprang into existence like a bowl of petunias in the upper atmosphere of Magrathea, saying, Oh no, not again. Oh, 1105. This was the Oracle GL account number associated for the transitory account of all the lockbox payments. November 8th. The mountain cowered under the shadows of a snowstorm. Look, I'm wearing a snow cap. Isn't it cute? The slug, ignoring the mountain's childish glee, put on its running shoe and did its stretching exercises. It would look better if an eagle were circling your head like those Earthlink commercials. November 14th. The mountain sat smugly, silently, wearing a fur coat and a snow cap and tried to act jolly. The slug glowed in its renewed health. I am having the opposite of erosion. November 20th. The slug in the mountain sat down to discuss, to discuss matters of Disney history. I don't know what to tell you, slug, the mountain said. Stephen King summed, opened up a can of worms when he tried to pin down what kind of animal Goofy is after declaring that Pluto already represented dogs in the Disney universe. The slug rose up on its foot, extending its eyes as far as it, they could reach. Oh, come on, it can't be that hard. Lady is a cocker spaniel. Bambi is a deer. The seven dwarves are... Well, they're midgets. The Shaggy D.A. is an English sheepdog. Ballot is a German shepherd. Todd is a fox. Shriek is an ogre. Memo is a clownfish. So you see, every character in the Disney universe is a clearly documented member of our catalog universe. So I ask you again, what model of car is Lightning McQueen? The mountain shrugged. Memo's dad was not that funny. I want to say 1978 Corvette, but that's not quite right. Oh, come on. Memo's dad was quite the comic thespian. What has the postman from Cheers got on Albert Brooks? The mountain turned away in disgust. The slug is also not that funny. November 21st. The non-existent ogres in our universe grumbled impatiently while reading yesterday's narration. Hey, where does that spell checker get, and ch get off changing our names? We are Disney characters. We have clout. Who is this Nemo, Balto, Shrek? Bill Gates is deeply regretful for the dissing that his software has given the Disney characters. He will make a public announcement of his apology as soon as he is done snickering. November 27th. The Mountain decried this case of absenteeism, complaining, I wish the slug would stop running around without his shoe on. I've been slimed. I feel so funky. The slug chastised the Mountain. You know, instead of complaining all the time, you could offer some constructive advice once in a while. The mountain thought for a moment. Here's one. In every job that must be done, there's an element of fun. Find the fun and snap. The job's a game. Cheeky. November 28th. Zorg hobbled back and forth in his warehouse, bemoaning his face. This case is empty, he said. The opposite of full. He dropped the lid of the case and limped aggressively up to the Mangalore captain. There's supposed to be four stones in it, he shouted. Not one or two or three, but four. He turned away in disgust. What am I supposed to do with an empty case? The Mangalore captain scratched his head as he struggled to think. We're not twins. Zangalor Zorg turned around. Huh? The Mangalore captain wore a confused face. Oops, sorry, he said. I think that was dialogue from Splash. Eugene Levy stepped up and said, Nope, nobody here but me and the moron twins. 
December 4th. The quagmire oozed with slime. The mountain looked down. Look, a swamp! The slug concealed it with, squealed with excitement. Yay, a place I can call home. Peter Vinkman strolled up with a Petri dish in his hand. Egon, your mucus. December 12th. The governor stood up with a sudden look of panic. We've got to protect our phony baloney jobs, he shouted. Harumph, harumph. Hedy Lamarck, that's Hedley, chimed in. Harumph, harumph. The clerks and other officials joined in, chanting, harumph, harumph. The governor stopped the chanting and pointed an accusatory finger. I didn't get a harumph out of that guy. Hedy Lamarck, that's Hedley, smacked the gavel on the desk. Meeting's adjourned, he announced decisively. He quickly turned meekly to face the governor. Oops, sorry, Your Honor. You're supposed to say that. The governor spun around incredulously. What? Meeting's adjourned. It is? No, you're supposed to say that. What? Meeting's adjourned. It is? December 13th. Mystery movie soundbite. Pithy British voice. Don't worry, I shan't kiss you. Gravelly American voice. Pity. I shaved extra close this morning in preparation of being smacked by you. The slug gla glanced up at the mountain and smugly pondered. What is it with all these walk-ons? Can't he do anything original? From the edge of the swamp, a voice called out. Jody Verrill, you lunkhead. You done it now. December 19th. The slug looked up at the mountain and asked, What's this new green stuff growing in the swamp? The mountain looked surprised. I don't know. From the edge of the swamp, a voice called out again. Jody Verrill, you lunkhead, you done it now. The gooey green slime bubbled noisily. I have no SLA. I am free to stink up this swamp forever. An acronym for service level agreement. The number of days which a person or team is allowed to be behind in a given task, which is updated daily. December 26th. Tips, hints, and guidelines for maintaining of the Santa Claus myth. Always get your kids to leave milk and cookies out for Santa. The sugar wrench will help you at 2 a.m. and the milk will help you sleep at 3 a.m. However, if you don't eat them, don't put individually decorated sugar cookies back in the cookie jar. Your kids will recognize them later in the week. Never light a fire in the fireplace on Christmas Eve night. Your kids will be furious when they find out why, because they'll remember how many times you unthinkingly did it. Wrap Santa's presents in gift wrap that the kids have never seen. Santa wraps his presents somewhere other than your house. <clears throat> December 28th. According to Douglas Adams, the answer to the ultimate question of life, the universe, and everything is 42. According to D Douglas Adams, the question is, what do you get if you multiply 6 by 7? December 29th, bad, uh, baby New Year reached out towards the old man as he trudged away, trudged away in dis, in, to the, into the distance and said, oomph, oomph, oomph. Old man XXXX stopped and turned around. He raised his eyebrows in surprise. Better get out of that lockbox soon, kid. You have to breathe sometime. January 9th. The pointy-haired boss stood in front of the crowd of employees and announced, I would like to commend you all on your productivity. Don't think I haven't noticed your efforts in teamwork, because I haven't. January 10th. In Willie's metrics, I am reporting three days out of our SLA and no history. JL 1105 is now only 46 days out of current. Still no SLA to whimper about yet. As achievement balances are inactive, X million, XXX thousand, XXX dollars. Income, XXX thousand, XXX dollars. It's cheated, zero dollars. January 11th. Oh, come on, Earl. He's only four. In Willie's metrics, I'm reporting two days out of our SLA with no history. Rockbox is only 38 days out of current. No SLA yet. Its achievement balances are inactive, X million, XXX thousand, XXX dollars, income, XXX thousand, XXX dollars, its achievement, zero dollars. Brian Doyle Murray playing Frank Cross's father in Scrooge. All day long I listen to excuses as to why people can't work. My back hurts, my legs ache, I'm only four. 
The sooner he learns that life is intended to you on a silver platter, the better. January 15th. Mater hopped over Lightning's head as he sang in Doc Hudson's voice. Now as for the dancing, you can do more. You can reach great heights. In fact, you can soar. In Willie, Willie's metrics, I am reporting four days out of our SLA and no history. Lockbox Recon is patiently sitting at 39 days out of current. No SLA yet. Mater thumped his rear tire on the rocks and continued, You just get a leg up and you slap it on down, and you find you're up in what's called the bound. Its achievement balances are inactive, X million, XXX thousand, XXX dollars. Income, XXX thousand, XXX dollars. It's cheated, zero dollars. Bound, bound, bound and rebound. Miniature peppy bugs crawled out of their burrows to see what was going on. Mater grinned happily. Bound and you're up, right next to the sky, and I think you can do it if you give it a try. Mater danced merrily around lightning. Now in this world of ups and downs, so nice to know there are jackalopes around. January 17th. In Willie's metrics I am reporting six days out of our SLA and no history. Lockbox Recon is 40 days out of, 42 days out of current. X was absent yesterday. X was absent yesterday. We work Xless. Its achievement balances are inactive. X million XXX thousand XXX dollars. Income XXX thousand XXX dollars. It's cheated. Zero dollars. January 18th. In Willie's metrics I'm reporting four days out of our SLA and no history. Lockbox Recon is trudging along at 44 days out of current. Its achievement balances are inactive, X million, XXX thousand, XXX dollars. Income, XXX thousand, XXX dollars. It's cheated, zero dollars. January 18th. The slug looked over at the mountain and pondered aloud. I don't feel like an extended metaphor. I feel like a snail. The mountain looked down at the slug and replied, You've always been slow, even in school. But I don't feel like an epic simile. I feel like a big pile of dirt and rocks. And I really do have athletes' foothills. The swamp made a few muffled noises. The mountain and the slug answered in unison, Yes, we know. The green stuff which had overtaken the swamp sneered up at the mountain. I feel exactly like an extended metaphor. It's much more reassuring than being aware of my reality. January 19th. In Willie's metrics, I'm reporting three days out of our SLA and no history. Lockbox Recon is 45 days out of current. Its achievement balances are inactive, X million, XXX thousand, XXX dollars. Income, XXX thousand, XXX dollars. It's cheated, zero dollars. The slug groaned, I feel so lightheaded. That third number is still zero, the mountain observed. Maybe you should have eaten your breakfast. January 22nd. In Willie's metrics, I am reporting four days out of our SLA and no history. Lockbox recon is 45 days out of current. GL-1003 recon is having a division by zero error. Its achievement balances are inactive, X million, XXX thousand, XXX dollars. Income, XXX thousand, XXX dollars. It's cheated, zero dollars. The slug stood up, wavering. I'm feeling much better now. I think I'll go for a walk. The mountain coddled the slug. Now that's a challenging visual. You should take it easy. GLing can take a lot out of you. The Oracle GL number, Oracle GL account 1003, represented a recently acquired division which remained its own, which retained its own bank account. Its revenue stream was so small that it did not actually require any reconciliation other than downloading its bank statement from the bank's website. January 23rd. The division by zero error is holding, holding GL-1003 in a massive headlock. Lockbox complained impatiently. How can a headlock be massive? Your arms are the same size no matter what you do with them. Here, look. Put your hand, arms in a bucket of water and measure how much water is displaced. Then flex your muscles and see if the water level changes. The mountain cautiously observed. Um, uh, the division by zero error has no arms. The slug interjected, right there with you, pal. January 24th. In Willie's metrics, I am reporting six days out of SLA and no history. 
Black Box Recon is 48 days out of current. GL-1003 Recon is slipping into unconsciousness. Its treatment balances are inactive, X million, XXX thousand, XXX dollars. Income, XXX thousand, XXX dollars. It's cheated, zero dollars. January 25th. In Willie's metrics, I am reporting seven days out of SLA and no history. Black Box Recon is 48 days out of current. Oh, sorry, 49 days. GL-1003 Recon is snoring loudly. Its cheatment balances are inactive, X million, XXX thousand, XXX dollars. Income, XXX thousand, XXX dollars. It's cheated, zero dollars. January 26th. GL-1003 Recon is being devoured by the Division by Zero error. January 29th. GL-1003 Recon is rapidly becoming a figment of my imagination. Excitedly, the slug announced, Hey, I know. Let's all some say something ludicrous and incomprehensible in the hopes that it means something. The mountain glowered at the slug. The lockbox sneered, You're really hung up on this extended metaphor thing, aren't you? January 30th. The slug explained, I have issues. The mountain leaned forward. What's the matter, little buddy? Cut it out, skipper, the slug reported. The lockbox snapped. What is your larval trauma? I just can't accept that I don't exist. The swamp suggested, maybe you should think of yourself like a unicorn or Pinocchio. The mountain cheered, or Tinkerbell. The green stuff that had taken over the swamp asked, huh? You remember how Tinkerbell began to fade away because she believed that nobody loved her? Then Peter Pan got everybody to clap their hands to reassure Tinkerbell that she still exists? Maybe this will help the slug. The green stuff cheered, yes, let's do it. Clap, 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 clap. Hey, not so close. Clap, 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 clap. Ow! Oops, can somebody get me a paper towel? Jody Verrill, you lunkhead, you've done it now. <clears throat> January 31st. GL-1003 Recon is fending off a renewed attack by the Division by Zero Error. February 1st. In Willie's metrics, I am reporting nine days out of SLA and no history. Lockbox Recon is 54 days out of current. GL-1003 Recon has bravely fought off the Division by Zero error and stood proudly out in the fields. Its treatment balances are inactive, X million, XXX thousand, XXX dollars. Income, XXX thousand, XXX dollars. It's cheated, zero dollars. I'll bet you wish I would stop reporting the balance of that third account. February 2nd. In Willie's metrics, I am reporting 9 days out of our SLA and no history. Lockbox Recon is 54 days out of current. GL-1003 Recon is gasping for breath like a netted porpoise. Its treatment balances are inactive, X million, XXX thousand, XXX dollars. Income, XXX dollars, XXX thousand. It's cheated, zero dollars. The slug whimpered, I'm wasting away to nothing and my eyes hurt. I knew I should have clapped more softly. The mountain coddled the slug again. Have you been able to visualize this one yet? You know, Rene Descartes said something very helpful to your situation. He said, cogito ergo sum. But I don't speak Latin. The mountain dropped the slug and walked away. Oh, you're beyond hopeless. The swamp suggested an alternative. Speaking of hopeless, Nietzsche said, eke homo. The slug retorted, but I'm not human. Howard Johnson pointed his index finger in the air and announced, It was Nietzsche who said that out of, chaos, out of chaos comes order. Insert bodilized response here. Gabby Johnson stood up, swung his fist decisively, and shouted, Rare it! <coughs> the omitted dialogue from Blazing Saddles was another character in the movie shouting, Oh, blow it out your ass, Howard. February 5th. In Willie's metrics, I am reporting 10 days out of SLA and no history. Lockbox Recon is 56 days out of current. GL-1003 Recon is struggling against the coils of the tuna net that has entrapped it. Its treatment balances are inactive, X million, XXX thousand, XXX dollars. Income, XX thousand, XXX dollars. Is cheated, zero dollars. Look, the swamp explained, if you can think, you'll satisfy Descartes' maximum prove your existence. The slug looked away. What shall I think? 
Think anything you want. What's the Pythagorean theorem? What's two plus two? What's the meaning of life? What's the color of Jeannie's light brown hair? The slug despaired. I don't understand. The lockbox stuck up. Look here. Dinosaurs had a brain the size of a walnut, and they could think. Mountains, the mountain spoke up. Barney has a brain the size of a walnut. He looked around at the others, who were glaring at him angrily. Oops, bad example. The slug snapped. Are you saying that I have a brain the size of a walnut? Well, it would be a compliment in your case, since your whole body is smaller than a walnut. February 6th. <clears throat> In Willie's metrics, I am reporting six days out of SLA and no history. Lockbox Recon is 57 days out of current. GL-1003 Recon has escaped the tuna net and is slowly recovering from claustrophobic trauma. His treatment balances are inactive, X million, XXX thousand, XXX dollars. Income, XX thousand, XXX dollars. It's cheated, zero dollars. February 7th. In Willie's metrics, I am reporting six days out of SLA and no history. Lockbox Recon is 58 days out of current. GL-1003 Recon is roaming happily through the ocean. His achievement balances are income, X million, XXX thousand, XXX dollars. Income, XX thousand, XXX dollars. Is cheated, zero dollars. Now that your balances have stabilized, the mountain began, you have gotten some rest. You should try to think now. The slug closed its eyes. I'm trying to think, but nothing happens. The mountain complained. What is wrong with your brain? It was working just fine until I tried to use it. If you can't think, you'll be nothing more than an extended metaphor forever. The slug strained every muscle in its body. Its foot lurched out to one side, and its eye stalks extended to their full length. One of its eyes bulged out. The slug said, Oop, ack! The mountain leaned back. Ooh, that looks painful. The lockbox looked on. Oh no, he's becoming Bill the Cat from Bloom County. The slug spat out an orange hairball while streaking out, sticking out its tongue. Oop, ack! February 8th. The apparition of the wizard's head shouted, Pay no attention to that man behind the curtain. The wizard looked over his shoulder, then turned back to the microphone. The great end! He turned to look apologetically at his visitors again. Oz has spoken. After humbling himself before his visitors, he explained to the Scarecrow why everybody can have a brain. It is a very mediocre com commodity. Every pusillanimous creature that crawls on the earth or slinks throughout the slimy sea has a brain. Back where I come from, we have universities. Seats of great learning, you see, where men go to become great thinkers. When they come out, they think deep thoughts, and with no more brains than you have. But they have one thing you haven't got, a diploma. Therefore, by the virtue of the com authority vested in me by the Universitatis Committee Autumn e Pluribus Unum, I hereupon, I hereby confer upon you the honorary degree of THD. THD? The wizard replied, eh, that's Doctor of Thinkology. <clears throat> the scarecrow put his finger to his temple and recited, The sum of the squares of any two sides of an isosceles triangle is equal to the square of the remaining side. Oh, joy! Rapture! I've got a brain! The slug turned from the movie screen and looked at the lockbox. But what if you don't have a brain? I'm just an invertebrate. The lockbox shrugged. Don't look at me, I've got my own troubles. I'm just an iron cube with a keyhole and barred windows. February 9th. GLT, GL-1003 Recon is beginning to doubt its own existence. The slug asked, What? Was it that Obi-Wan Kenobi sat on the Millennium Falcon when Alderaan got blown up? I feel as if a million voices cried out and were suddenly silenced. Or maybe I just have food poisoning. The green stuff that had overtaken the swamp rebutted, Serves you right. That was my hair you've been eating. The mountain wondered aloud, Um, uh, dot dot dot. Use your words, mountain. This isn't pre-K. I wonder if doubting your existence could be considered proof of your existence. The slug looked aghast. Do you mean that I can think and not have to... No, do you, do you mean that I can th exist and not have to think in order to prove it? Well, how could you doubt your existence if you don't exist? The slug shared. Cool, I don't have to believe that I have a brain the size of a walnut. The lockbox chided. That's good, I always thought your brain was smaller than that too. To be fair, you don't have to believe you have a brain at all. The slug looked around. So, do I exist? Am I a slug? Nope, you're still just an extended metaphor. 
but you're an existent one. February 12th. Chagrined, the slug exclaimed, I'm so clever, I outsmarted myself. The mountain consoled the slug. It's okay, I'm an extended metaphor too. The lockbox said, I'm also an extended metaphor. The swamp admitted, I guess we're all extended metaphors. The porpoise said, I am not a tuna. The green stuff that had overtaken the swamp said, What? Who's not a tuna? The porpoise chirped happily. The mountain asked, Did somebody step on a duck? The porpoise chirped happily again. Is there a loose board in here? February 13th. Come here and pull my finger, said the lockbox. The porpoise chirped happily. The mountain asked, What is that? Is somebody rocking a in my chair? The porpoise chirped happily again. The swamp looked out the window. Did I forget to set my car alarm? The porpoise chirped happily yet again. The slug looked around. It wasn't me. The porpoise said, I am not a tuna. February 14th. GL1003 Recon prefers not to be called Flipper. February 16th. Where is my narrator? The slug wailed. I have a bone to pick with him. The black box argued, You're an invertebrate. The swamp, the mountain, and the green stuff that had overtaken the swamp fearfully blurted, Harumph! The lockbox muttered, Oh yeah, harumph! The porpoise chirped happily. The mountain looked around. What is that sound? It wasn't a harumph. February 19th, GLT 1003 Recon is doing midair flips and twists. February 20th, in Willie's metrics I am reporting eight days out of SLRA in no history. Lockbox Recon is planning a cruise to the Arctic Circle. GL-1003 Recon is eating prawns. His treatment balances are inactive, XXX thousand, XXX dollars. Income, XX dollars, XXX. Is, she, is cheated, zero dollars. <coughs> A huge conflagration, conflagration swept through the swamp, singeing away leaves from trees and annoying the green stuff. The slug skittered away, but not fast enough to save its leathery hide. Ow, it shrieked. I've been sautéed. The mountain said, Aw, oh, here, let me put some butter sauce on that boo-boo. The garlic will help heal your skin. The slug groaned. It would feel a little better if you hadn't put so much lemon juice in it. February 21st. In Willie's metrics, I am reporting nine days out of SLA and no history. Lockbox recon is 68 days out of current. GL-1003 recon is contemplating its navel again. His sheepman balances are inactive, XXX thousand, XXX dollars. Income, XXX thousand, XXX dollars. It's cheated, zero dollars. The porpoise chirped happily. The mountain tried to comfort the slug. My poor little babalucci. The slug, nursing its wounds, shouted, Stop referring to me as an Italian food. February 22nd. In Willie's metrics, I am reporting ten days out of SLA and no history. Black Box Recon is behaving erratically. GL-1003 Recon is dancing on the waves. Its treatment balances are <clears throat> inactive, XXX thousand, XXX dollars. Income, XX thousand, XXX dollars. It's cheated, zero dollars. The Black Box quivered nervously. Hey, slug, can I borrow your S-car? The slug snapped. My goose is cooked. I've been flame broiled and you want to borrow my car? The Black Box looked around nervously. You don't have a goose? The mountain inquired. What is your depository trauma? February 26th. Lockbox recon is conspiring with the slug. February 27th. In Willie's metrics, I am reporting nine days out of SLA and no history. Lockbox recon is square dancing with the porpoise. Its treatment balances are inactive, XXX dollars. Income, zero dollars. Its cheated, zero dollars. The slug is acting like Marty McFly on stage to fish under the sea dance. The mountain is rubbing moss on its north face. February 28th. In Willie's metrics, I'm reporting 10 days out of our SLA and no history. Lockbox recon is still 68 days out of current. The porpoise is meandering in the depths of the Atlantic Trench. Its treatment balances are inactive XXX dollars. Income, zero dollars. It's cheated, zero dollars. Hey, slug, Lockbox reported. I think that the green stuff is out to get me. The slug replied, you're just being paranoid. The green stuff reported, no, really, I am out to get you.
The slug stepped in front of the lockbox and announced, Never underestimate the power of the foot. March 1st. Lockbox recon is 42 days out of current. GL-1003 recon is marveling at the lockbox's ability to look like Casey Kasem. Its cheatment balances are inactive, XX6 dollars. Income, zero dollars. It's cheated, zero dollars. The porpoise chirped happily. Lockbox asked, why are you staring at me? The porpoise answered, you look younger. How do you keep your youthful vigor? The lockbox answered, a steel bristle brush and Murphy's oil soap. March 5th, its cheatment balances are inactive, zero dollars. Income, zero dollars. It's cheated, zero dollars. The mountain is freaking out. Where is the slug? Where is my little buddy? The swamp looked around. Maybe he's invisible now, like Doonesbury's representation of George Bush Sr. The mountain slumped. Well, he is just an extended metaphor. Poor kid. I hope he's all right. The porpoise stirred happily. I'm a slacker. <clears throat> March 6th. In Willie's metrics, Vivian is reporting seven days out of her SLA and no history. Lockbox recon is 45 days out of current. GL-1003 recon is dancing merrily on the waves. Its cheatment balances are inactive, zero. Income, zero dollars. It's cheated, zero dollars. Bump, ow! The mountain whirled around. What was that? The slug replied, do you, go, do you guys know how hard it is to move around when you're invisible? The mountain looked aimlessly around while speaking disjointedly. Being able to see would probably help some. Pull your eyes out. The green stuff frenetically struggled with the keyhole on the lockbox. How can I get this to open? The mountain whimpered at the green stuff. You shouldn't be in too much of a hurry to get that lock open. You'll just poof out of existence. The green stuff snarled at the mountain. I am the first lockbox recon. I invented it. Me, me, me. March 8th, GL-1003 Recon is singing the Ballad of Leona Helmsley. Its cheapment balances are all zeros. March 9th, in Willie's metrics I am reporting six days out of our SLA and no history. Lockbox Recon is 48 days out of current. GL-1003 Recon is basking in the sun. UAC RAR balances are inactive, zero dollars. Income, zero dollars. It's cheated, zero dollars. This green stuff was frenetically trying to pick the lock in Lockbox's keyhole. The slug roared. The mountain despondently observed, Boy, I couldn't see that coming. How could you? The slug retorted, I'm invisible. The green stuff retorted, Could you guys help me over here? The mountain peered over at the green stuff's shoulder. What do you expect to find in there? A picture of Sammy Hager torquing his guitar into the floor? Nope, the green stuff quipped. Po bills. The mountain looked confused. Oh, boys? I'll have one with pastrami, the swamp suggested, and provolone cheese. The green stuff snapped. I'm not looking for a sandwich, I'm looking for a magic hat. The swamp groaned. Oh, here we go with that snowman stuff again. He's got frosty on the brain. March 12th. In Willow's metrics, I'm reporting three days out of our SLA and no history. Lockbox recon is 49 days out of current. Jail 1003 recon is getting hungry. UAC RAR account balances are inactive, XX thousand, XXX dollars, income, zero dollars, roared, zero dollars. <coughs> the green stuff started pounding on the lockbox. How am I supposed to get this lock so open? Unseeing, the mountain mumbled, I think I can see the slug. Gabby Johnson stood up and shouted, Raren! The swamp held back the green stuff's florets. There's no sense in getting violent. Maybe there's a logical approach. The green stuff stood back. What do you mean? I need to physically open this lock. This is no place for telekinesis. The swamp retorted, Well, it's not rocket science either. All you need is proof. Proof of what? The porpoise happily chirped, Proof to poof? Proof that it works. Proof that what works? The lock. Well, how do you prove that a lock works? Try to open it. It won't. There, you see, it works. The green stuff looked up in wonder. With a gentle click, the lock opened. Poof. Footnote. On this day, management had decided to grant the reconciliation team authority over the lockbox and research and reconciliations. 
March 13th. In Willie's Metrics, I am reporting three days out of SLA and no history. Lockbox Recon is 50 days out of current. Must be time for the black balloon treatment. GL 1003 Recon is slaloming the reefs. UAC recognized as revenue balances are inactive XXX thousand XXX dollars. Income zero dollars. Rarid zero dollars. Cody Verrill, you lunkhead, you done it now. The lockbox asked, Does anybody else feel a draft? The mountain in the lock in the swamp looked around, coughing from the sudden cloud of smoke. Hey, where did the green stuff go? The swamp cheered. Now my cypress teeth can breathe. The slug rejoiced. My left eye stalk is visible. Can you see me now? The mountain strained to see. I think your iPod is talking. <clears throat> Maybe it's done downloading all those MP3s you ordered, the swamp suggested. The slug grunted audibly. I was once a mighty gastropod, and now you, all you see is an iPod? March 14th. In Willie's metrics, I am reporting two days out of our SLA and no history. Lockbox Recon is 51 days out of current. GL-1003 Recon is munching on seaweed, possibly the remains of the green stuff. UAC recognizes revenue account balances. Inactive XXX thousand XXX dollars. Income zero dollars. Rarid zero dollars. <coughs> March 15th. In Willie's metrics, I am reporting zero days out of our SLA and no history. Rockbox Recon is 52 days out of current. GL-1003 Recon is frolicking in the surf again. UAC RAR account balances are inactive. Z XXX thousand XXX dollars. Income, zero dollars. Rarid, zero dollars. The door on the lockbox opened slowly with a loud creaking sound. Lockbox turned around suddenly shouting, Hey, stop peeking at my underwear. The mountain shrugged. There's something inside. It's not your underwear. At least there are no pictures of Batman or Spider-Man on it. The slug spun its eye stalk around. Look, it's a top hat. The swamp mumbled bemusedly. It's the magic hat that the green stuff was talking about. Frosty stood motionless as though asleep. Take it out, the slug ordered. Put it on. The mountain grabbed the top hat. No, it'll mess up my snow cap. Here, you wear it. I'm not going to wear it. You wear it. The porpoise chirped happily. Hey, let's get Mikey. We don't have a Mikey here. The mountain turned the top hat over. Several objects fell out. What's that? The slug shrieked in surprise. Fortune cookies. March 16th. The porpoise quickly swallowed up the fortune cookies. Hey, the mountain argued. There might have been good fortunes in those. The porpoise chirped happily. Maybe I can do my mighty Karnak impression and read them from inside my stomach. But what about the cookies, the slug compa complained. I'm hungry. Not to worry, the porpoise answered. I can't taste them to the plastic wrap anyway. March 19th. A little voice whimpered, oil can. The mountain roared at the porpoise. I can't believe you ate my cookies. The porpoise shrugged. I am not a tuna. Will you stop saying that? Would you rather I remind you that my name is Inigo Montoya? The slug interrupted. Hey guys, I think somebody needs our attention. Oil can. The mountain turned in the direction that the sound was coming from. What do you want? You're not a tin man, you're a snowman. Waspy Frosty whimpered a tear. I just want to say happy birthday. The slug thought for a moment, looking at the ground as though searching for a frenetic little rabbit. No, it's our magic hat, and you can't have it. Roger Dalty crooned, I want it, I want it. Timney and Shiro bellowed, It is the rabbit! Look at the bones strewn about! March 20th. The mountain stumbled over the slug. Sorry, it's hard to know where to step these days. The slug howled in pain. That's okay, it's a temporary condition. The mountain asked, has anybody seen a rabbit? Bugs Bunny sneered. Sheesh, what a maroon. Be careful with my magic hat, the lockbox said. Angelo turned away from the bar. Sure, I seen a rabbit. Say hello, Harvey. The mountain scurried around. There must be a rabbit here somewhere. Roger Rabbit bluttered. I just want to make people laugh. The slug twirled its one visible eye stalk around. I don't see anybody else here. 
The porpoise chirped happily. March 21st. The porpoise recited, Never maintain eye contact with, with chrome bulldogs, with a glazed look in its eyes. The mountain asked, What was that? I think I can read the fortune cookie fortunes. The slug was busily rummaging around in the magic hat. I think there's something in here. It feels furry. Ignoring the slug's discovery, the mountain asked, Can you read any of the other fortunes? The porpoise squirmed a bit. I think this one says, Hornets will encircle the lawnmower in your yard. The mountain opened its eyes wide in surprise. The slug's visible eye, taught, eye stalk turned up. What? Oops, that's wrong. I think it says, Honesty and integrity are the landmarks of your life. The slug returned its attention to the inside of the magic hat. I just hope this isn't a sorting hat like the one in those Harry Potter, Potter movies. Why? I'm just afraid it will tell me I belong in Slytherin. March 22nd. The slug continued to search the inside of the magic hat. Its visible eye stalk swirling around the brim like a spoon stirring coffee. The mountain asked, So, if it's not a sorting hat, what are you supposed to do with it? Perform magic tricks? The slug answered, I don't know. The lockbox suggested, Maybe you're supposed to make something disappear. Hey, maybe we can make the mountain disappear. The slug replied, I've done that. It's not as much fun as it looks. The mountain wondered aloud, maybe we should say some magic words and see what happens. A puddle of water began to spread around Frosty's base. A little voice whispered from inside of the packed snow, uh-oh. <clears throat> March 23rd. The slug held the magic hat upside down in the hopes that something would fall out of it. A little white rabbit wearing a burgundy waistcoat rushed into view. I'm late, I'm late, it stammered. Alice galloped along behind it, calling out, Mr. Rabbit, wait! I wonder if my frosty is melting, Rockbox pondered. The mountain answered, It must be spring. He always hates it when the thermometer gets all red. The little white rabbit scurried out of view, still stammering, There is no time to wait. I'm late, I'm late. March 26th. GL-1003 Recon is frenetically chasing minnows. March 28th. A large chunk of snow fell off of Frosty's midsection. The slug rummaged around the inside of the magic hat, like Vladimir or Estragon from Samuel Beckett's play I'm Waiting for Godot, as though trying to find out if the intelligence that was supposed to be in his head was actually in the hat. Try saying some magic words to see what happens, Lockbox suggested. You mean if I say, Abracadabra, the Steve Bellerman, might pop out and start singing Fly Like an Eagle? Yeah, and if you say Hocus Pocus, Professor Hinkle will steal, will show up and try to steal the hat. Or if I say Shazam, maybe Captain Marvel will fly in to save the day. Or if I say Razzmatazz, some other rock band will pop up and start singing Love Hurts. The carrot nose slipped out and fell to the ground. Frosty's entire body shuddered as though trying to shake off an itch that it couldn't scratch. March 29th. The mountain asked the slug, Why do you keep fumbling around inside that magic hat? There's nothing in it. The slug replied, We're close. I can feel it. Judge Doom strolled throughout the bar, sneering at Angelo while tapping rhythmically on the walls. No rabbit can withstand the classic shave and a haircut gag. Suddenly, Frosty exploded in a cloud of snow and coal lumps, revealing a grayish rabbit with black spots. Two bits! The slug looked up in shock. The mountain turned around slowly. Lockbox did a double take. Lockbox murmured, The rabbit's not in the magic hat like you thought. The slug looked around inside the hat dejectedly. Then what's in here? The porpoise chirped happily. I am not a tuna. March 30th. The mountain looked at the rabbit. Aren't you supposed to say happy birthday? Do I look like a snowman? The rabbit asked. But you said two bits. Are you Roger Rabbit? No. Well, then it's nice to meet you. I am the mountain. I represent the accumulation of errors and transmissions throughout the past year. My foot hills contain... Listings of the transmission errors for this year, along with the yard gnomes wearing lederhosen who are yodeling while headbutting the mountain goats off the stony crags, half-buried snowmen trying to outswim snow sharks, and snowball-fighting flamingos who are shivering from the cold. The swamp stepped up. I 
represents a massive research project that seeks misrecording of several checks and arcs. Lockbox stood up next. I represent an iron cube with a keyhole and barred windows, the robber retorted. You are an iron cube with a keyhole and barred windows. The slug spoke up. I don't actually exist. Hey, I can see you. You have a really big foot. April 2nd. So, what do you represent? The lockbox asked the rabbit. The rabbit cocked its ears. I don't represent anything. I'm an animated character. The mountain reacted incredulously. You mean you're not an extended metaphor? Nope, I'm a tune. Standing beside the magic hat, the slug asked, Tune? No, tune. It's pronounced the same, but it's spelled T-O-O. The rabbit did a double take. Wait, this isn't a visual medium? A dry hand reached out of this magic hat, grabbed one of the slug's eyeballs, and pulled him in. A furious tur turmoil resounded from inside the magic hat. Rain poured. Hail fell. Footnote. The person who developed the exception-based reconciliation process was known to be a late sleeper whose schedule was staggered two hours later than everybody else's schedule. The going commentary was that if she came to work early, it would hail. So naturally, according to Murphy's Law, the meeting in which the, she was asked to unveil her new reconciliation process was scheduled for 7 a.m. Ignoring the fray, the mountain answered the rabbit, This is narration. Lockbox suggested, Well, we do have sight gags. Here, watch this. Lockbox did a double take. Did you see that? The slug flew out of the magic hat, landing on the ground with a squishy thud. I'll get you for that. The slug shouted into the hat. Sounding like Peter O'Toole, the rabbit turned to Lockbox and said, I'm not a prose character, I'm a cartoon. The slug stuffed its foot inside the magic hat and pushed it around. Take that and that. The mountain and the lockbox looked over at the slug and the magic hat. The rabbit stormed off. With a mighty earth, the slug pulled something out of the magic hat. A duck-billed platypus stood beside the magic hat and said magnanimously, Good morning, good afternoon, and if I don't see you again, no. Good morning, and if I don't see you again, good afternoon, good evening, and good night. The porpoise chirped happily. April 3rd, GL-1003 Recon is out swimming snow sharks. They're not that fast. April 4th, as the stunned silence subsided, the mountain, the lockbox, and the swamp looked from the duck-billed platypus to the magic hat and then to the slug. The slug nervously glanced inside the magic hat and then turned to face the others. Well, I can't help it. It's what was in the hat. The porpoise chirped happily. I fear bicycle tires. Oops, I think that was a Taco Bell sauce packet. The lockbox looked around. Where is that wascally rabbit? April 5th. GL-1003 Recon is perusing a waterlogged fragment from the wreckage of the Titanic. April 6th. Lockbox glared at the slug and shouted, You've created a chimera! The slug stepped back fearfully. The mountain turned to the lockbox. What's a chimera? It's an ancient Greek mythological creature in which appropriate body parts of different animals are put together to make a monster. Lockbox, lockbox explained. Kind of like Frankenstein. The duck-billed platypus shouted, That's Frankenstein. Besides, I'm not a chimera. The swamp stepped forward. The slug is a chimerist? The slug scowled. What would that be? A mime with bells? Have you been practicing chimeristry? The swamp asked. What kind of trees? Lockbox held up a hand. Not to worry. Those kind of trees don't grow here. The mountain looked up at at its tree line. Nope, nothing but the spruce and Douglas fir is here. There's no poison sumac growing on me. The duck-billed platypus spoke up again. Um, excuse me, I'm not a chimera. The porpoise chirped happily. I'd buy that for a dollar. The rabbit shrugged scornfully. I am so glad I don't belong to this world. April 9th. The porpoise suggested, How about if I start spouting conundrums? Lockbox did a double-take, as if the platypus isn't enough of a conundrum. The porpoise asked, is it futile to eat yogurt while taking antibiotics? First I was a chimera, now I'm a conundrum. When will I become a convenience? Right after you finish being conflagrated, the rabbit smug, smugly mumbled. The slug asked, are you still here? 
April 10th, the duck-billed platypus streak conflagrated. Lockbox defended his statement. Well, yes, it's a trial by fire. But you can't scorch me. I have fur. The rabbit leaned smugly on a wall. You don't have to scorch him later. Scorch him now. The platypus advanced on the rabbit angrily. You stay out of this. Turning back to the lockbox, the platypus said, I am not a duck. Postscript. The prevailing opinion holds that it is beneficial to replenish one's intestinal flora during the purative process of antibiotic treatment, so keep eating your yogurt. The porpoise bubbled its head decisively and swam away. April 11th. GL-1003 is drifting in the Sargasso Sea. Footnote. Later research revealed revealed that yogurt bacterium does not survive in the human digestive tract. However, when a cow eats yogurt once, the bacteria becomes a permanent component of its digestive processes. April 12th. Lockbox sneered at the porpoise. Don't even start. The porpoise shrugged. What? April 13th. Resist the urge to kick me, the porpoise chirped happily. The porpoise, por platypus looked over its shoulder. The porpoise explained, it's the five C's of business development. Chimera, conundrum, conflagration, change, and convenience. The mountain stepped up cautiously. Repeat after me. My job is to keep my boss from getting fired. Who is my boss? The customer. Lockbox answered. Haven't you seen all those FedEx commercials lately? The platypus thought for a moment. Change. That's a new one on me. What's up with that? After you were conflagrated, you have to change. The mountain explained. The platypus shrieked, but I'm not wearing a costume. This is what I really look like. April 16th. In Willie's metrics, I am reporting zero days out and no history. Lockbox recon is 69 days out of current. GL-1003 recon is fishing for minnows. UAC RAR balances are inactive. X million, XXX thousand, XXX dollars. Income, zero dollars. Rarid, zero dollars. The lockbox stepped towards the platypus. Are you ready for your conflagration? The platypus shivered nervously. I don't want to do anything that's going to hurt or make me all sticky. The mountain stood expectantly behind the lockbox, looking over its shoulder. The lockbox shooed the mountain off. Hey, stop looking over my shoulder. I don't have one. The swamp asked nervously. But what are you going to do? Conflagration is going to be dangerous. The lockbox thought for a moment, then looked around. I shall give the platypus an intelligence test. The slug, slug shrieked. Now wait, just a cotton pit can minute. I got flames, real flames, and he gets questions? April 17th. In Willie's metrics, I am reporting zero days out of SLA and no history. Lockbox recon is 70 days out of current. GL-1003 recon is pondering conundrums. UAC RAR balances are inactive. Zero X million XXX thousand XXX dollars. Income zero dollars. Holding XX thousand XXX dollars. The slug was all irate. I was dripping butter garlic sauce with lemon juice. Do you have any idea how much that stings? The lockbox looked expectantly at the platypus. What do you think? The platypus snickered. Is this part of the test? I forgot to bring my fondue fork. The slug interrupted. And then I was invisible. The mountain stepped on me. Twice, the swamp muttered. Still leaning on a wall, the rabbit snickered. Ain't I a stinker? April 18th. In Willie's metrics, I am reporting zero days out and no history. Lockbox recon is 71 days out of current. GL-1003 recon is reading 17th century poems. UAC RAR balances are inactive. X million, XXX thousand, XXX dollars. Income, zero dollars. The mountain sat expectantly, watching the platypus in the lockbox. The swamp gurgled impatiently. The lockbox began, The first part of your test will be simply, Name the fourth president on Mount Rushmore. The platypus laughed, Oh, that's easy, it's Lincoln. The one in the middle. Huh? Teddy Roosevelt? Is he the one in the middle? No, the one that nobody can remember. Oh, that was Gerald Ford. He's not on Rushmore, the lockbox snarled. The slug limped up. Did anybody see a lawnmower pass through here? I think my lawn got mowed last night while I was sleeping. The mountain smiled. Oh, did you get a haircut? It looks nice. Hey, where's the toe of your Nike? 
April 19th. In Willie's metrics, I am reporting zero days out of our SLA and no history. Lockbox Recon is 72 days out of current. GL-1003 Recon is basking in the sun. UAC RAR, RAR balances are inactive. X million, XXX thousand, XXX dollars. Income, zero dollars. GL-1003 Recon is basking in the sun. April 20th. And now for the second question of the intelligence test. The lockbox said, what is 2 plus 2? The slug stepped up, snarling. Oh, come on, they're supposed to be hard questions. The lockbox turned around. Who are you to complain? Did you know the fourth president on Mount Rushmore? The slug looked down in dis despair. The mountain thought for a moment. Well, there's Washington on the left, Lincoln on the right, Teddy Roosevelt is one of the two in the middle. And the other one in the middle is the one that nobody can remember, the lockbox added. The mountain started trying to guess. Buchanan? Van Buren? The swamp perked up, suggesting Garfield. The mountain sidled up to the swamp and the slug followed. Yes, that's the one. The lockbox snipped. Oh, right, guys. I suppose next you'll tell me that Odie is the Statue of Liberty. Bill Murray strolled across Ellis Island, politely asking, Are there any national monuments here? Looking up, he cheered, Oh, hello, miss. April 23rd. Now let's return to the intelligence test. The lockbox stubbornly returned its attention to the platypus. What is two plus two? The platypus quickly answered, Five. The mountainous slug in the swamp did double takes, nearly bumping each other's heads. The rabbit snickered devilishly. The lockbox snapped, Five? Do you know that that's the wrong answer? Twice plus two is really four. Twice two makes four is, in my humble opinion, nothing but a piece of impudence. Where would you get such an idea? The mountain asked incredulously. The platypus replied, Fyodor Dostoevsky, in his 1861 story, Notes from the Underground. The rabbit's jaw dropped. The slug peered intently into the magic hat. The porpoise chirped happily. The high-pitched high whirring sound moved across the sky too rapidly for anyone to see. The mountain looked up. Did anyone else hear that? April 24th. The mountain stepped up to the lockbox. Hey, wait, I have a test that's not based on intelligence. The mountain huddled with the slug whispering. <clears throat> the mountain stood before the platypus and raised up before him. It's a role-playing exercise. Are you ready? The platypus shook its head. The slug kneeled before the mountain, supplicating, Oh, great mountain, I have no numbers for you today. The mountain bellowed loudly, Fear not, loathsome insect, I have plenty of numbers for everyone. The platypus wet himself. Looking on the swamp said, Oh yeah, he's a keeper. April 26th. The lockbox held up his hand. Now wait just a second, you missed the second question. How do you explain that? The platypus scowled. You have to think outside the box. The lockbox furrowed its brow. That's kind of hard for me to imagine. Logically, twice two actually does equal four, the platypus explained. Dostoevsky's narrator says, Twice two makes four is a farcical dressed-up fellow who stands across your path with arms akimbo and spits at you. Mind you, I quite agree that twice two makes four is the most excellent thing but if we're to give everything it's due, then twice two makes five is sometimes the most charming little thing. Two. He was making his argument against the mathematical predictability of human behavior in defense of free will. He was also decrying the impermissibility of wrongness. You have to accept that errors can and do occur in order to understand them. The lockbox stood aghast. You actually read that stuff? The platypus responded, I'm an egg-laying mammal with a duck's beak, a beaver's tail, and webbed feet. What kind of social life did you think I would have? April 27th and April 28th. When the lockbox finished laughing, it announced, We are now ready to move on to the next phase of the intelligence test. Judging this important segment of your testing will be Dilbert, the engineer. The swamp guffawed. He cannot be permitted to judge here. He's human. Why should that matter? There are no other humans here. You should have called up his dog. The lockbox thought for a moment. Okay, you're right. The lockbox returned its attention to the platypus. 
Judging this important segment of your testing will be Dogbert, famous for his performance in the supporting canine role in the comic strip Dilbert. Dogbert stepped up. May I sniff your crotch? The platypus shrieked. I'm a he, and I'm the only gender-specific character here. The porpoise chirped happily. Dogbert strolled nervously around, sniffing the ground. The mountain rose up, shouting, I'm not a fire hydrant. Stop that. Dogbert stood up. What about you, slug? The slug retracted its eyeball, eye stalks. I'm just afraid that you might, that I might get stuck in one of your nostrils. Dogbert turned around. Sorry, I was just trying to be polite. Nicely not done, the lockbox affirmed. April 30th. The swamp suddenly jerked out of its slumber to find itself completely alone. Hey, where'd everybody go? Looking around, the swamp found a note. It read, Gone to see key old Monty Python movie. Underneath that, it said, BRB. April 1st. Leading the way, the lockbox turned around and reminded its companions. We must remember not to discuss topical news issues until they are in the past. Mmph, mmm, mmph, the slug exclaimed. Dogbert pulled the slug out of its left nostril with a liquidy popping sound. The slug shrieked, Ow! The mountain asked dejectedly, I wonder why the swamp didn't come with us. Dogbert reassured the slug, You'll be fine. Your sinuses are moist, the slug snidely remarked. If they were dry, I'd, been, I'd be a goner. The rabbit asked, where are we going anyway? The lockbox turned around. Are you still here? April 2nd. <coughs> the slug slithered along on the ground in front of the mountain while the lockbox led the way with the platypus and the rabbit. Dogbert marked each landmark after sniffing it, then trotted quickly to catch up to the group. Stop that, the snug slug complained. Dogbert sternly questioned the platypus. How do you explain these incorrect answers? Gerald Ford is the fourth president on Mount Rushmore? Twice two makes five? How are your friends supposed to tr trust your accuracy as a recon process? How are your readers supposed to comprehend your reference as an extended metaphor? The platypus replied, I know that James Monroe is the fourth president on Mount Rushmore and that twice two is really four, but my task as a recon process is to reveal the errors and consequently my responsibility as an extended metaphor, is to answer questions wrong. The mountain spoke up. So what is your responsibility as a recon process? To reconcile the lockbox with poor Mr. Bill, the platypus answered. The lockbox shrugged. I could never stand to be around that guy. I really had hoped that Mr. Sluggo could have gotten rid of him once and for all. The platypus patted the lockbox on the back. Now, now, you know that it's not healthy to think that way. April 3rd. They walked for miles. At one point they passed by a dentist's office and peered in the window. Bill Murray lay sprawled across an examining chair, squirming like a child while sputtering between cotton swabs in his mouth. It's your professionalism that I respect. Bemusedly smirking, they continued to on their way. When they reached Florida, they all climbed onto the porpoise's back and to ferry across the ocean. As it swam, the porpoise asked the mountain, Could you scoot back, please? Your foothills are stinking up my air hole. <clears throat> the lockbox fearfully clung to the porpoise's dorsal fin. All this salt water could give me a nasty, nasty case of rust. April 4th. Poe Mr. Bill sat on the White House steps singing the blues. The swamp lumbered up the steps and sat down beside it. The bill looked over and mumbled, What do you want? The swamp heaved a sigh and answered, I'm waiting for my friends to come back. Why are you here? The bill stood up and sang his well-rehearsed song, I'm just a bill. Yes, I'm only a bill, and I'm sitting here on Capitol Hill. Well, it's a long journey to the capital city. It's a long, long wait while I'm sitting in committee, but I know I'll be a law someday. At least I hope and I pray that I will, but today I'm just a bill. The swamp thought for a moment, then said, Asked, you don't even know who Mr. Sluggo is, do you? Nope, that's Mr. Bill. I'm just a Bill. Haven't you been paying attention? April 7th. The porpoise sidled up to the shore. Dogbert and the platypus leaped off while the mountain rolled up into the surf. The slug slithered to the tip of the porpoise's snout and hopped onto the sound. Sand. Hee hee, that tickles, the porpoise snickered. 
The rabbit kicked at the water playfully. The black box hovered mysteriously across the shore and settled on a dune. Dogbert looked at the platypus nest. By the way, do you remember that gravelly-voiced American who told the pithy British man that he shaved extra close because he thought he would be kissed? The platypus replied, Yes, it was Patton talking to General Montgomery in Messina after he had taken the town before Montgomery could get there. Good. Don't tell that story here, Dogbert remained the platypus. There are some bitter feelings here in England about that. The mountain blew bubbles in the water as it rose above the shoreline. Why are we in England? We are on a quest, Blackbox answered. We are searching for the old Monty Python movie. <coughs> the rabbit looked up. Shouldn't we look on Netflix for that? Yes, but the seawater would mess up my laptop. The mountain asked, where is the old Monty Python movie? Near a bridge guarded by the old man from scene 24. April 8th. Dogbert eagerly led the way across the English countryside, cutting away the brush with a machete. Lockbox drifted alongside, rising above the shrubs to avoid them. The platypus followed closely, looking around at the horizon on both sides. The mountain and the slug trailed along behind them. Too bad the por porpoise couldn't come with us, the lockbox remarked. The mountain replied, I can't imagine it would be too healthy for a marine mammal to be hopping along on the ground like a mud skipper. Meanwhile, at the White House steps, the swamp sat beside the bill, looking at the lawn patiently. May 9th. Dogbert continued to lead the group across the English countryside, sniffing the ground nervously. They trudged through a swamp and stopped beside before a castle built in the center of the bog. The mountain grinned, I can't wait to tell our swamp that there are others. The slug looked up at the castle and saw a morose figure dressed in white standing in one of the tower windows. Who's that? The rabbit gingerly tiptoed across the muddy flats and entered the castle. Dogbert followed, leading the platypus. The mountain and the slug waited outside. The lord of Swamp Castle met them in the foyer. You just missed a wedding, he said. Sir Lancelot ruined the whole thing. Dogbert looked at him and said, I've come to chew up your shoes. The platypus stopped stepped in front of Dogbert and politely interjected, No, he didn't. We are on a quest. We are looking for a bridge, and we think that your son wants to sing a song. The Lord of Swamp Castle blustered, Oh, no, you're not going to do a song while I'm here. The rabbit headed for the door. Come on, let's go. There's nothing funny in here. April, uh, May 10th. The swamp continued to sit on the White House steps with the bill. A beautiful kitten strolled across the lawn, purring audibly. Pippi Le Pew, the amorous skunk, walked up and asked, Have any of you seen the most angelic little creature pass by here? The swamp, the swamp shrugged, looked over at the bill and pointed off to the right while asking, Was that angelic? I don't know about these, these things. I'm a swamp. Before Pippi Le Pew could follow this kitten, a large dog ran up and grabbed the skunk off the steps. He snuggled the skunk against his chin and said, This is my friend. I'm going to name him George, and I'm going to pet him and love him and... Pippi Le Pew wrestled himself from the dog's grasp and ran off after the kitten. The dog stood there stupidly with his arms at his side for a moment, then walked away. The swamp pulled out a booklet and began to thumb through the pages. The bill cast a bewildered look at the swamp. What are you doing? Still searching intently through the pages, the swamp replied, I'm checking my calendar to see when... The Tasmanian devil is scheduled to appear. I'm going to call out sick that day. <coughs> the bill smirked, then stood up to sing the second verse of his song. Suddenly, the Lord of Swamp Castle rushed up and shouted, Nope, stop that! No singing! May 11th and May 12th. The rabbit skirted out of the mucky courtyard of Swamp Castle, followed closely followed by Dogbert. The platypus slid across the muddy puddles as the mountain and the slug trudged through the mire. Once they had gotten to a grassy area, Dogbert took preventative measures. He set a small bear trap in a place hidden by tall grasses. As they passed the mountain and the slug, asked, What's that for? Dogbert answered, You'll find out soon enough. Let's go. We have a bridge to find. We should sing some songs to pass the time. Does anyone know a thousand bottles of beer on the wall? May 14th. Dogbert announced, while we travel, we shall sing a song by Cat Stevens. 
Which one? The rabbit asked. If you want to sing out, sing out. From the movie Harold and Maude. Also available on his Greatest Hits Volume 2, Footsteps in the Dark. The mountain and the slug stepped up alongside the platypus. They all sang together. Well, if you want to sing out, sing out. And if you want to be free, be free. Because there's a million things to be. You know that there are. And if you want to live high, live high. And if you want to live low, live low. Because there's a million ways to go. You know that there are. About 20 yards behind them, the sound of rustling grass reached their ears. Clack! Ow! Dogbert looked over his shoulder and muttered, Gotcha! Then he spoke louder. Okay, resume singing. You can do what you want. The opportunity's on. And if you find a new way, you can do it today. You can make it all true, and you can make it undo. You see, huh? It's easy, huh? You only need to know. Well, if you want to say yes, say yes. And if you want to say no, say no. Because there's a million ways to go. You know that there are. May 15th. The swamp stood up on the steps, looking around. The bill cowered fearfully on the steps. I'm not sure if I should sing my second verse. The swamp sat down again. Oh, go ahead. I'm sure Dogbert took care of that guy. The bill stood up. Is it safe? Pippi Le Pew ran across the lawn again, whimpering over his shoulder as he passed. You call this safe? The large dog lumbered along after him silently. The bill put his hand on it to his heart, raised his other hand and sang, I'm just a bill. Yes, I'm only a bill. And I got as far as Capitol Hill. He stopped singing and looked around nervously. Well, now I'm stuck in committee and I'm, I sit here and wait while a few key congressmen discuss, discuss and debate whether they should let me be a law. Oh, how I hope and pray that they will, but today I am still just a bill. A large bird fell out of the sky and bounced the bill down the steps. The swamp looked up and asked, Hey, where'd that come from? Meep, meep, the bird said. The mountain in the lockbox sat in the English countryside eating McGriddles. The slug lapped happily at a puddle of, at a puddle of brackish water while Dogbert nibbled on grasses. The rabbit looked over and said, That's kind of bizarre. The platypus glanced at the rabbit and responded, Not really. The lockbox looked anxiously up at the sky, imagining a high-pitched swirling sound. What is that bird? The slug turned around and asked, Maybe we should ask Wiley Coyote. Nah, the lockbox replied. He doesn't ever have dialogue, just like Tom and Jerry. May 17th. After a junk food breakfast, Dogbert led the way across the English countryside with the platypus and the rabbit following closely. The lockbox hovered precariously over their heads. The mountain and the slug followed behind. They approached a rocky place surrounded by mountains. Dogbert began to scamper up the rocks with the rabbit hopping alongside him. The platypus waited while the slug crawled up the sides of the stones. The mountain lumbered up the face of the mountain confidently. The platypus looked up and remarked, Now there's something you don't see every day. The rabbit sprinted ahead of Dogbert, reaching the crest first. Look, there it is. We found it. Dogbert heaped himself up over the last ridge and looked where the rabbit was pointing. We should wait. The rabbit looked down at the slow progress of the mountain and the slug and grimaced at the platypus's procrastination. Come on, we're here. He glanced over at Dogbert again. Let's go on ahead. Dogbert reminded, No, we need to wait. The mountain and the slug finally reached the crest of the mountain and looked acro across to the ridge where an old man was standing beside it. The platypus began climbing once he was sure that the mountain was safely ensconced on the crest. The rabbit shouted, Are we a team here? Dogbert rested his paws on his haunches and tapped his foot impatiently. The mountain looked over at the lockbox and the slug and replied, Well, we are. Footnote. Oddly, this anecdote is literally plucked from real events. After a nasty conflict concerning accessibility of the company's bank statements, a member of the credit card team stormed out of the office immediately behind me and shouted, Are we a team here? Since I had my headphones on, I could not have heard her, but I did, and I blurted out my answer thoughtlessly. I don't think she ever forgave me for that. May 18th. While climbing, the platypus looked up and shrieked, It's a bird! It's a plane! It's a... The mountain looked up and pondered, Maybe it's a UFO. 
Dogbert turned around. Just so long as we don't quote that line from Fifth Element when they find that bomb on the door in the hotel. Just like scurried under a crack in the rocks. The bird smacked onto the rocks jeeringly, muttering oomph as it sprawled across the stones. Dogbert waited while the bird righted itself and began cleaning its feathers. Aren't you glad I'm not a cat? The bird began to sniff around. Dogbert snapped, That's my area, if you don't mind. I smell something tasty under here, the bird quipped between snorts. The slug cowered further into the crack. The bird caught it in its beak and began to swallow. The shrug shrieked, I did not come all this way to be breakfast. It launched itself out of the bird's throat and landed on the mountain's foothills. The bird started pecking fearfully near the slug. The mountain howled in pay. Hi, hey, that hurts. May 21st. The slug was busily scurrying away from the pecking bird's beak. The bird laughed maniacally as it continued to jab its beak into the soil of the mountain's foothills. The rabbit waved its arms in the air. Come on, let's get this over with already. Dogbert put up his paws in defiance. No, we have to wait for King Arthur and his knights of the round table. The mountain scowled in confusion. What? You mean here? Dogbert spun around. Yes, we're not watching the movie. We're in it. The slug stopped for a moment and thought aloud. Oh, how Matrix. Then he scurried away again, just in time. The platypus blinked in sudden awareness. Oh, I know what this is. I've seen this movie about 167 times. The platypus leaned toward the gorge of eternal peril and put its webbed foot to its ears. Michael Keaton's voice rang out from the depths of the gorge. And it keeps getting funnier every time I see it. Dogbert pulled the platypus's arms down. Now, you need to be ready, like Tim Robbins in that baseball movie. You have to be able to breathe through your eyelids. The platypus smirked. I can make fart noises with my armpits. Will that work? The platypus lockbox groaned in despair. Welcome to the desert of the real. May 22nd. GL-1003 Recon is chasing Pompanos. They're really fast. May 23rd. The bird stopped pecking for the slug and stood upright. There's nothing funny here anymore. It's also agenda-driven. The lockbox scratched its chin and pondered aloud. Well, we don't do any lawyer jokes here. I'm wary of the seriousness, the bird remarked as it strolled dejectedly past Dogbert, who had folded its ar his arms in dis in contempt and watched the bird closely. Opus the penguin strolled across a brick half wall where Charlie Brown and Linus Van Pelt were wont to discuss the nature of their universe in years past. Opus stopped, spun around as he on his heels and shouted, Pear dimples for hairy fishnuts. Big Bird, Woodstock, and Tweety Bird stepped up and stood in a row. Woodstock murmured perpetually. Big Bird, Big Bird looked down and admonished, Stop that, you sound like a croaker. Al Pacino strolled across in front of the birds and snapped and stopped. He snarled and said, Say hello to my little friend. He squatted before the birds and patted Woodstock on the head kindly. Unnoticed, King Arthur and the knights of the round table scrambled past them, bashing coconut shells together and pretending to ride horses. Jack Nicholson walked on and smiled his devilish grin. Seeing no response, he shrugged defensively and asked, What? I can't do a walk-on cameo here? The bird hung his head low and moaned, I'm so hungry, I'm weak. The slug scurried away in fear. Big Bird pulled out an oversized 9-volt battery and held it out. Here you go, stick your tongue on it. May 24th, the rabbit looked over at the bridge of death and saw King Arthur and his knights standing in line near it. Look! Dogbert muttered, darn it, now we have to narrate each one of us turning to notice this happening. Can, can't we just skip that part? Skipping over the necessary narration of each character turning to notice the arrival of King Arthur and his knights to bridge, the slug saw Sir Lancelot pass safely, followed by the merciless launching of Sir Robin and Sir Galahad into the Gorge of Eternal Peril. Uh-oh, I foresee a problem, the rabbit sneered. Oh, don't worry, the platypus knows everything. We'll be... The mountain stepped on the rabbit's foot. The rabbit shrieked, Yow! That hurt! The mountain shouted, the platypus only gives wrong answers. That's what the slug is worried about. The rabbit stopped nursing its swelling foot for a moment and said, 
What do you have to worry about? You're a mountain. The slug scowled at the rabbit. Do you know the capital of Assyria? The rabbit grabbed the platypus's arm and pulled at him. Help me, he whimpered. I feel like Brundlefly right about now. The platypus began to perspire nervously. Huh? Sorry, I wasn't listening. What happened? May 25th. Dogbert cornered the rabbit. Your happiness and job performance are influenced more by coffee than any other factor. The rabbit wore a confused look. Eh, what's up, dog? Dogbert continued. Workplace efficiency is not a guaranteed consequence of mirthful fr frivolity. Meryl Streep stepped up and remanded, There isn't enough coffee in the world for a cause like yours. Captain James T. Kirk stepped up and announced, Coffee is not some abstract notion. We of the Federation need coffee, must have coffee, in order to survive. Bill Murray stood there looking insolently impatient. A bearded man stepped up to him and asked, Excuse me, Lumpy, I'm kind of new here, but I can't figure out how to get these antlers to stay on this little fellow's head. I've tried crazy glue. Crazy glue. Bill Murray fumed, Have you tried staples? Dogbert looked intently at the platypus. I'm on the most I'm the most famous bespectacled dog in the world. Do you know the name of the other famous bespectacled beagle? The platypus pressed the big red easy button, but nothing happened. May twenty ninth. The mountain and the slug walked up to the platypus. Well we're here, now what? The platypus shuffled its webbed feet and looked down. Before crossing the bridge of death, I was going to sing a rousing verse of the Jiminy Cricket classic, I'm No Fool. The mountain scowled accusingly at Dogbert. Dogbert shrugged and admitted, What? I looked on the internet. They're not there. The slug snapped at the platypus. You don't remember the words? The platypus confessed. Well, the Mickey Mouse Club is over 50 years old. The rabbit stepped in, shouting, Which makes you how old? The platypus looked up sharply. They were reruns. The slug kneeled before the mountain and bellowed in anguish. Oh, great and powerful mountain, I have no... Can it, worm? Dogbert snapped. The mountain shrugged plaintively. What's wrong? Dogbert turned to face the cat platypus. We have an appointment to keep. We must not stray from our agenda. The bird rolled its eyes and looked at the horizon. The mountain meekly asked, So now's not a good time for me to say something peak poignantly idyllic? Meanwhile, on the White House steps... The swamp sat dejectedly beside the bill. I'm starting to feel neglected. Pepe Le Pew sprinted across the lawn again, sputtering, I wish I could be neglected, between gasps. The large dog chased closely after him, shouting, Sit and stay. Rick Moranis checked his pockets. Maybe I got a milk bone. The bill stood up, put one hand on his heart, and held out his other hand majestically. I'm just a bill. Yes, I'm only a bill. And if they vote for me on Capitol Hill, well, then I'm off... To the White House where I wait in line with a lot of other bills for the President to sign. And if he signs me, then I'll be a law. Oh, how I hope and pray that he will, but today I am just a bill. May 31st. The rabbit sat on a stone, methodically tearing a piece of paper into evenly sized strips. Better hurry up and cross that bridge, he directed. The Langoliers are coming. The lockbox did a double-take. Langoliers? What are they? The rabbit looked up from his activity and answered, They're giant silvery Pac-Man creatures that eat away reality as it moves into the past. Our memories are the only record of time. The slug shrugged. Gee, that's humbling. Hey, platypus, are you ready to face the bridge keeper? The platypus wavered. I have butterflies in my tummy. The slug scowled. You shouldn't have eaten so early. Dogbert stepped up, holding his paw and the air as if to emphasize an important point. Whatever happens, don't go running away screaming, pulling your hair out from its roots. The lockbox quivered noisily. Yeah, I get that sometimes, too. The mountain looked up, wondering what was meant. Never mind that. Let's go. With that, they all strolled happily towards the bridge, singing, We're off to see the wizard, as they walked arm in arm. P.S. It's a Stephen King thing again. June 1st and June 2nd. Dogbert stepped up to the bridge. The bridge keeper held up his hand menacingly. Stop, he commanded. Who would cross the bridge of death must answer me these questions three, ere the other side he see. Dogbert stepped up confidently. Ask me the questions, bridge keeper. I'm not afraid. The bridge keeper asked. What? 
is your name? Dogbert rubbed his forepaw on his chest and blew on it. My name is Dogbert. The bridgekeeper asked, What is your quest? Dogbert answered, To prove the competence of the platypus. The bridgekeeper asked, What is your favorite color? Dogbert thought for a moment, trying to recall the scene from the movie. Finally, he moved to speak, but hesitated. Watching nervously, the rabbit soiled itself. The mountain quivered. The platypus whispered, This feels like a Mentos moment. Finally, Dogbert raised his paw up and answered, Blue. The bridgekeeper waved magnanimously. Right, off you go. Dogbert bowed graciously, said, Oh, thank you, thank you very much. And he strolled happily across the bridge. The rabbit charged, saying, Oh, that's easy. The lockbox moved across to block the rabbit's path. Hold your horses. The rabbit stepped a few stepped back a few steps, looking confused. <coughs> we aren't riding horses. Yet suddenly I feel the urge to accuse you of having two coconut halves that you were banging together. Why would I want to say such a thing? Are you saying that my skull is empty? Well, those aren't brain cells making that noise. June 4th. Dogbert called from across the bridge. Come on! Lockbox stood firmly, blocking the path to the bridge. Haven't any of you seen this movie? We're not all Monty Python fans, the bird answered. Dogbert chided them distantly. I suppose you prefer Benny Hill. Well, he does have peppier music, the mountain responded. The lockbox despaired. You were all so culturally deprived. I've seen this movie about 167 times. Almost on cue, Michael Keaton's voice rang out from the depths of the Gorge of Eternal Peril. And it keeps getting funnier every time I see it. The rabbit stood in front of the lockbox defiantly. What's to fear? As long as we know what our quest is and what's our favorite color, we'll be allowed to cross the bridge safely. The lockbox rested its hands on its hips. Do you even know what your favorite color is? More to the point, do you have a name? The rabbit looked at the ground despondently. Seconds later, he brightened up, shrieked in excitement, and launched himself onto the ground. Look! Carrots! June 5th. The bill sat on the White House steps, staring intently at the reflecting pool that stretched out from the Washington Monument. He swatted the swamp fitfully. Wake up! You're snoring! The bill stood suddenly. And you've been drooling on the stairs. Yuck! The swamp stirred. Huh? What? The swamp stretched and yawned. I'm getting bored. Have you got a book to read? The bill smiled eagerly. I have words on me. Here, read me. The swamp rubbed its eyes and thought for a moment. Okay, leaning back, the swamp studied the bill carefully. You are an impractical solution to a misunderstood problem. The bill jumped. I didn't say read my character. Read me personally. The swamp blustered audibly. Oh, okay. Well, then, on a personal level, um, uh... Your friends find your pedantic verbosity annoying, but fearfully respect your ability to burst into flames. The bill wavers, waved its hands in exasperation. I didn't ask for a psych evaluation. Can't you say something good about me? The swamp yawned again. You'd make a very nice birdcage liner. June 6th. The bill stomped off the steps onto the lawn. No, read my words. The swamp rubbed its eyes again. Finally, the swamp looked up, eyeing the sky. Well, yesterday's narration says the bill sat on the White House steps, staring intently at the reflecting pool. The bill charged right up to the swamp. No, you fool, not the words about me. Read the words that are on me. The swamp struggled with the alternatives. On your arm, it says, I heart Stacy forever. You overgrown broccoli farm, not my tattoo. The swamp looked away in growing agitation. What? You're just a bill. The bill stomped down the stairs again. Never mind. Let's watch TV. Come on, the reflecting pool gets cable. The swamp lumbered down the steps after the bill and made its way towards the reflecting pool. The bill pushed a red, big red easy button on the side of the Washington Monument. The reflecting pool flickered starkly for a moment and then glowed with moving images. The bill pulled the TV remote from inside its pages. What would you like to watch? The swamp scratched its chin. There's a good cooking show that I've always enjoyed, hosted by some guy named Chef Ramsay. The bill looked at the reflecting pool. Oops, it's still on the Disney Channel. Supreme Court justices always watch this. Members of Congress gravitate towards Animal Planet, while Senate members seem to enjoy the Travel Channel. The swamp smirked. What does the president like? Nickelodeon. Noggin. 
June 8th. Far Side Cartoon Reference. As the three of them simultaneously went for the tennis ball, the coconut light sound of their heads colliding secretly delighted the bird. All right. Across the bridge of death, Dogbert was rolling on the ground, laughing hysterically. The bridgekeeper smirked in amused, bemused disinterest and then turned to peruse the condition of the other characters. Everybody was lying on the ground motionless near the carrot stalk. Finally, the rabbit twitched, pushed the slug off of its back, and stood up, rubbing its head as he looked around at the others. Cool, it worked. The bridge keeper scowled and shouted, You silly rabbit, tricks are for kids. June 11th. The bridge keeper stepped forward towards the rabbit in concern, his straggly white beard flowing in the breeze. Are you all right? he asked. The rabbit stood up. Yes, I'm feeling all right, and I'm not feeling too good myself, but I'm all right. The bridge keeper took another step forward. What happened? The rabbit winced as he touched the sore spot on his head. We all lunged for the carrot at the same time. <clears throat> the bridge keeper stopped, stood straight, and grimaced angrily. Just what did you think to accomplish with such a stunt? The rabbit lowered his paw and allowed his ears to droop. I was kind of hoping to be able to cheat my way across the bridge. The bridge keeper moved his staff to rest in the crook of his elbow while holding up his free hand. He counted on his fingers while looking up into the clouds. After a few seconds, he smiled and gestured towards the bridge. Right! Off you go! The rabbit perked up excitedly and hopped happily across the bridge. Dogbert stopped laughing and stood up suddenly, growling fiercely. June 12th. The bridge keeper quickly returned to his station at the escarpment of the Gorge of Eternal Peril. The rabbit watched joyfully from behind him. Dogbert stomped across the bridge at him. Who do you think you are? The bridge keeper gave a surprised look. I don't know that. As he raised his hand up to his chin, he suddenly flew up into the air. Wah! As his voice trailed off, he descended into the Gorge of Eternal Peril. Seconds later, he bounced up into the air again and landed clumsily on the bridge planks. It's the shoes, he said calmly as he straightened his tunic and pulled his hair away from his face. They have coil springs in the soles. It's an idea I got from Spring Speed Racer. Dogbert bit him on the leg and stomped across, back across the bridge to sit beside the rabbit. The rabbit grinned idiotically at the bridge keeper and turned to face Dogbert. Dogbert slapped the back of the rabbit's head and quipped, Stop it, McGee! June 13th, mistakenly labeled June 12th. The bill stumbled up the steps morosely. There's nothing on. The swamp looked up at the White House suddenly. Sadly. Suddenly, a senator stepped out of the front door and rapidly skipped down the steps in a mindless hurry. He slipped on the bill and landed on his butt. When the bill finally settled on the steps below and the senator raised his fist angrily, the bill held out his hands defensively. Hey, don't slug me! The senator lowered his fist and turned to look across the lawn. A corporal stepped up in front of the senator and saluted. Resist the urge to kick me, sir. The senator sneered. Stop saluting. I'm a civilian. Sorry, sir. We have a situation, sir. The senator looked away. Stop calling me, sir. The corporal was taken aback. But you're a government official, sir. I'm a civvy. Don't call me, sir. Yes, sir. Sorry, yes, sir. I mean, sorry, sir. Um, sorry again. The corporal looked at the ground tensely. We have a situation that needs your urgent attention. What is it? First, resist the urge to kick me. June 14th, mistakenly labeled June 13th. In order to maintain the necessary brevity of this text, the remainder of the Senator's conversation will be narrated with attribution flags only. Corporal, resist the urge to kick me, sir. Senator, I'm trying, son. Corporal, we have a situation that requires your immediate attention. Dogbert bit the bridge keeper. Senator, what, you mean the cartoon dog with glasses that drinks coffee? Corporal, yes sir, he bit the bridge keeper on the leg when the rabbit cheated his way across the bridge of death. Senator, why did the rabbit cross the bridge of death? Corporal, I suppose we'll be wondering about that for many years, sir. He knocked out the rab mountain, the bird, the slug, and the platypus by pretending to lunge for a carrot, regained consciousness before the others, and when the bridge keeper asked him three questions, he answered them correctly and was allowed to pass. Senator, well, that's not really cheating, then, is it? Corporal, I suppose not, sir. Pause. The other characters are still unconscious. What shall we do now, sir? Senator, 
You realize that we're talking about a bunch of extended metaphors, don't you? Pause. I'm really trying not to kick you right now. <laughs> June 15th. At the bridge of death, the mountain, the slug, the lockbox, the platypus, and the bird lay slumped in a heap before the bridgekeeper, who stood waiting over them. Dogbert sat beside the rabbit, patiently while the rabbit danced the happy dance of Snoopy. The Langoliers chomped away at the past, approaching the ridge where the bridge of death spanned the gorge of eternal peril. They smiled gently, apparently enjoying the unique flavor of the English countryside. June 18th. Corporal, we'll send a strike team under cover of night, and Senator, no, 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 son, that'll never do. You see, there can't be any fatalities over there. They're just a bunch of extended metaphors, for crying out loud. Corporal, but they're American extended metaphors. Ambushed in the land of Shakespeare. We've got to protect our in interests abroad. Senator, you're a lummox. Turning to the swamp. He's gone daft, I tell you. Pause. Oh, you're just a swamp. What do you know? Corporal, the rabbit might not be crazy. It could be a clever ruse. Senator, dog slobber. Every rabbit I've ever known has been crazy. Just name me one rabbit that was sane. Corporal, thinking... Shrugs. Senator, the Mad Hatter was a rabbit. Did you ever think about that? Even Fiverr from that Watership Down story was a bit nutty. Corporal. Shrugs again. What about Thumper? Senator, tell you what, my boy. From this moment forward, every time I think about you, I'm going to mutter the word lummox out loud. June 19th. The slug turned his eyes upward to the sun and muttered something resembling, Huh, what? It might have been a sneeze. Its head slumped onto the ground again. The lockbox rose up, rubbed its eyes, and muttered ow as it scornfully rubbed its head. Looking down at the platypus still laying unconscious under the sleeping mountain, the lockbox suppressed a sob. Dogbert walked up, put his paw on the lockbox's shoulder, and whispered, He's going to be okay. He'll have a nasty headache, but he'll be fine. The lockbox wiped a tear from its eye. The rabbit walked up and said, Quick, before he wakes up, let's paint him white and put a sailor suit on him. The lockbox spun around harshly. He's not a duck. Antonio Banderas, mimicking his performance as Puss in Boots in Shrek 2, tiptoed up behind the rabbit and whispered, Hey, boss, let's shave him. June 22nd. In Willie's metrics, I'm reporting zero days out of our SLA and no history. Lockbox recon is 86 days out of current. GL-1003 recon is enjoying duck lover's weather. UAC RAR balances are inactive, X million, XXX thousand, XXX dollars. Income, XXX thousand, XXX dollars. Corporal, resist the urge to kick me, sir. Senator, lummox, 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 lummox. Corporal, sir, the Mad Hatter is not a rabbit, sir. Senator, lummox, 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 lummox. Corporal, however, the Mad Hatter's best friend is a rabbit, the March Hare. Senator, exactly. That's why finals week of college basketball is referred to as March Madness. Corporal, sir, the other characters are waking up now. There's a chance that they could cross the bridge of death by the end of the week. Senator, lummox, 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 lummox. Corporal, our only concern is the Langoliers are approaching the bridge of death quicker than anticipated. Apparently they think that English, England's past tastes like chicken. Senator, lummox, 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 lummox. June 24th, from Senior Finance Manager's email regarding one of the UAC accounts. Please change the description on the income account to UAC Suspense. Thanks. June 24th, reply to Senior Finance Manager regarding one of the UAC accounts. Aw, oh, gee, I was kind of looking forward to unactionable government holding. Then we could have had Rarid and UG. Starting tomorrow, the income account shall now be referred to as UAC Suspense. Footnote. The account labeled as Rarid was originally described as recognized as revenue, which offered the acronym RAR. June 25th. In Willie's metrics, I am reporting zero days out of our SLA and no history. Lockbox Recon is 76 days out of current. GLT... GL-1003 Recon is drifting on sea breezes again. UAC RAR balances are inactive. X million, XXX thousand, XXX dollars. 
Suspense. XXX thousand XXX dollars. Whoa! The slug jolted upright. I can't reach the ground. The mountain stirred sluggishly. Huh? What's the matter? Why are you floating? The bird raised its head and looked around. Ouch. Why did I think it was okay to butt heads with a mountain? The rabbit darted across the bridge and touched the mountain. Wait! Don't tell him! The mountain shrugged. Don't tell him what? The rabbit lowered its paws slowly and stepped back to watch the slug in admiration. He doesn't know. The mountain scowled. Neither do I. The slug squirmed as though trying to slither across the air. The rabbit sneered. He's in a state of suspended animation. It's like being a cartoon character, except not as funny. Dogbert snapped. He can hear you too, you know. After a few minutes of struggling, the slug clumped in the air. Well, this is just great. How am I supposed to cross the bridge now? The lockbox grinned proudly. Like this? The lockbox drifted across the chasm beside the bridge's span. The slug watched in wonder. And I'm supposed to know how to do that? The bridgekeeper looked on in growing agitation. Dogbert snarled. Hey, that's cheating. June 27th. Dogbert stormed across the bridge, bristling as his fur rose up on his back. Get back over there, lockbox. The bird stood up clumsily, flapping his wings for stability. How is this happening? The slug looked forward, trying not to burst into tears. Will you guys stop staring at me? This is embarrassing enough. The bird waddled up to the slug. You're looking mighty tasty, hovering there at just about beak level. Ignoring the bird's remark, Dogbert strode, strode right up to the rabbit. How are you doing this? I demand an explanation. The rabbit shrugged. Uh, Wingardium Leviosa? Dogbert slapped the rabbit on the back of the head again. I don't have time for your potter humor, and I don't think anyone else is laughing at your weaselly jokes. The slug whimpered as though trying to evade a painful cramp. I don't care how it is happening. I just want to touch the ground. June 28th. Dogbert watched the rabbit closely as he played up the mysteriousness of the slug's state of suspended animation. The slug began to weep, unable to contain the embarrassment and frustration any longer. The bird clicked its beak hungrily. Hungrily. The mountain shook off its grogginess and looked closer. You have a dirty foot. The lockbox nudged in front of the bird, half defensively and half in selfish wonder. He's just floating there. It's like he's sitting on a shelf, but the shelf isn't there. Dressed in a long-tailed tuxedo, Dudley Moore staggered up beside the lockbox, peered in at the slug and remarked, That's a lovely, uh... He gestured wildly at the slug in his own head as though trying to indicate an object that he couldn't describe. Finally, in disgust, he staggered away. Platypus, the platypus turned around, losing interest, and walked over to the bridgekeeper. Dudley Moore turned around and shouted, Hat! That's what it's called! It's a hat! The bridgekeeper held up his hand menacingly. Stop! he commanded. Who would cross the bridge of death must answer me these questions three ere the other side he see. The platypus stepped up confidently. Ask me the questions, bridgekeeper. I'm not afraid. June 29th. The corporal saluted and walked away. The, corporal, the senator stumbled out of, onto the lawn, mumbling lummox several times under his breath. The swamp watched dejectedly from the White House landing while the bill wiped its pages. I'll never get this footprint off. The swamp rolled backward towards the reflecting pool, leaning on the short wall. Gee, I hope they're okay. I'm starting to get kind of worried. The large dog stepped up, looking around. Which way did he go? Which way did he go? The bill tumbled down the steps and across the lawn and to the reflecting pool. He pressed the big red easy button again. Hey, he suggested, maybe the old Monty Python movie is showing. We can see what they're up to. The water surface flickered and showed an advertisement from Mon Hannah Montana. Hmm, the Supreme Court must have been out here for lunch. The Bill Channel surfed while the swamp watched eagerly. There it is. The image of the, in the reflecting pool showed the rocky ridge with the gorge of eternal peril slicing through it like a fissure in an ice flow. The bridge keeper stood at the bridge rubbing his chin scornfully. The platypus stood motionless in front of the bridge keeper. The lockbox was floating over the chasm beside the bridge as a blurry image of Dogbert started across the bridge. Camera follows Dogbert. The mountain, the bird, and the rabbit were huddled in a circle as Dogbert approached. Camera zooms out. Look, they're okay, the swamp shrieked in delight. But where's the slug? In the picture, as Dogbert approached, the rabbit stepped backward slightly. Camera zooms in. 
The swamp leaned closer, squinching up his eyes. Is that the slug? They're in the middle of everyone? Why is the slug floating? The bill shrugged. I don't know. Maybe they're going to play t-ball or badminton. June 3rd. No, sorry. July 3rd. The swamp leaned back. Phew. Everyone's all right. I can relax now. The bill looked closer. But look, the slug is crying. I wonder what's wrong. The swamp leaned forward and looked again. I don't know. I guess he's stuck. The swamp moved away from the reflecting pool. I guess we should just keep waiting. What should we do to pass the time now? The bill watched the swamp thoughtfully. We could dress up as ac astronauts, take yoga classes, and walk dogs. July 4th. The bill looked into the reflecting pool again. Hey, why is the platypus standing in front of the bridge keeper? The swamp turned around and scanned the length of the image carefully. Oh, wow! This is so exciting! This is what they went there for! The senator walked up behind the bill and asked, What are you doing? Some kind of mystical looking glass trick? The bill rolled its eyes in contempt and answered, No, we're watching a movie. The swamp cheerfully added, It's an old Monty Python movie. The senator shrugged, I never could understand British humor. Say, who's hungry? I think that Chef Ramsay has a restaurant here in town. The corporal stepped up dutifully and said, I think he's serving rabbit stew tonight. The bill gasped. The swamp fainted. Pepe Le Pew stopped in his tracks and looked at the nearby shrubs making kissing noises at them. The angelic current kitten scurried out of the bushes and ran away. Lummox. The senator led the way to the Pandemonium's Kitchen, a franchise of Chef Ramsay's famous ho restaurant in Hollywood. The corporal followed behind the swamp and the bill. They were seated quickly, and within a few moments were greeted by Chef Ramsay himself. I'm sorry it took so long to get you seated, but there's a terrible crowd tonight. The senator smiled. That's quite all right. I'll have the rabbit stew. The swamp eagerly asked, Do you still do that fried catfish with the alligator chips and frog legs? Chef Ramsay gulped. Uh, no, I took that off the menu because so few of our customers are swampy. But I can make it special for you tonight. The bill spoke up timidly. Do you have any leaded paint? Chef Ramsay looked at his hand nervously, then looked up again. His eyes glazed over and he wavered for a moment. Then he walked away silently. Moments later, he turned to the table with a large platter in one hand, a metal can in the other, and a bowl balanced on his elbow. Stumbling frightfully, he dropped the can onto the, into the soup bowl as it rolled off his elbow. So sorry about that. I'll clean that up right away. He scooped the broth from the floor back into the bowl with his hands, occasionally cussing in pain and licking his fingertips in agony. Finally, he held the bowl up over his head and handed it to the senator. Here you go. Sorry about the mess. Please don't be angry with me. He began to cry softly. June, July 6th. The senator looked eerily into the rabbit stew. The swamp watched Chef Ramsay expectantly. The bill quickly started lapping up its lead-based paint. Mmm, this is good. Chef Ramsay stood up sharply. I hope you like it. It's a strawberry-colored paint with copper flecks. I added a touch of dillweed for flavor. The swamp spoke up hesitantly. Um, where's my catfish? Chef Ramsay jumped and looked down. Oh, sorry, I'm standing on it. He reached down, picked it up, wiped a few bits of mud off the frog legs. There, not harmed a bit. He placed the platter down in front of the swamp gleefully. Now, if you'll excuse me, I have other customers to mistreat. He shuffled off shamelessly. The corporal hung his head in his hands. The bill looked across the table at the senator. What do you do in your spare time? The senator looked up from his rabbit stew and absentmindedly picked up a spoon. I dress up as Pippi Longstockings and kick trees. Sometimes I sing a delightful song while I'm kicking. The swamp smiled. Ooh, let's hear it. The senator cleared his throat. I'm a lumberjack and I'm okay. Suddenly there was a loud clamor at the restaurant's door. July 10th. Clank, ow, clank, ow, clank, thunk. Nope, stop that. No singing, clank, ow, thunk. The Lord of Swamp Castle appeared from the restaurant's foyer. He stepped up to the table and leaned forward towards the senator. I was wondering if you, one of you blokes could help me remove this bear trap from my leg. The senator looked down at the Lord's foot. That's not really your size, is it? The corporal kneeled beside the Lord's feet and began to pry the jaws apart from the Lord's ankle. Oof! The Lord of Swamp Castle winced as he tried to politely acknowledge the senator. No, I usually wear a tr 
13 Triple E, but when you're rushing through tall grasses to stop a dog from singing an old Cat Stevens song, you've got to wear what your foot falls into. He stepped aside as soon as the corporal had freed, freed his foot and then glanced at the table with a puzzled look. The bill had begun to get giddy from the lead-based paint and threw himself into the can, reclining his head drunkenly on the rim. The Lord of Swamp, Swamp Castle grimaced. I don't get this American humor. I like the, my jokes to have some spleen to them. Some vinaigrette on your burger, if you know what I mean. The senator frowned. I suppose you prefer David Letterman. The Lord of Swamp Castle smiled. Well, he does have those stupid pet tricks. July 11th. The senator looked warily into his bowl of rabbit stew. Swirls of pink paint commingled with the broiled potato and carrot slices. He dropped the spoon in disgust. Um, chef? He called out. Chef Ramsay timidly stepped up, wringing his hands nervously. Yes, Senator? What were you doing before you brought out our meals? I was cleaning up the counter where I had cleaned the fish for the swamp's entree. Do you know how many germs could be swimming in my broth? Chef Ramsay blustered audibly. Oh, not to worry. The toxins in the paint should kill whatever germs got in there. The bill sputtered in panic. Toxins? Chef Ramsay looked up reassuring. It's okay, you're soaking in it. July 12th. The mountain stammered inaudibly. Dogbert turned from the rabbit and scolded. Hush up, mountain. Unseeing, the mountain asked, Would now be a good time for me to say something poignantly idyllic? I'm just trying to keep you from saying something piquantly idiotic. The rabbit dashed around behind the slug. Hey, I have an idea. Platypus looked over its shoulder with a surprised look. The bridge keeper folded his arms and began tapping his foot impatiently. The rabbit picked up a rubber band from the ground and said, I know this will work. I saw it in a cartoon once. Not paying any attention, the mountain diffidently asked, What do you call a person who can sleep under the stars, bathed in moonlight, and wake up to the sunrise with morning dew on his brow? The platypus shouted, Doofus! I am trying to cross the bridge of death here. A little respect, please. July 13th. The bird, the mountain, and the lockbox looked up from the slug's position and stared in disbelief at the platypus and the bridge keeper. The slug stopped weeping and looked forward. The rabbit held the rubber band behind the slug, looped it behind his, between his thumb and forepaw, and pulled the middle section of it towards his face. The bridge keeper looked over and raised his hand hesitantly. You shouldn't be able to do that. You don't have opposable thumbs. The rabbit's ears drooped, but he looked up defiantly. It worked for Wiley Coyote. The bridge keeper walked around the platypus and rushed straight up to the rabbit while everyone else gasped at the mention of the great coyote's name. So you're going to just slingshot the bridge, slug across the bridge? The rabbit smirked. Nope, that would be cheating, and only the water boy is a cheater. He let go of the rubber band. The slug screamed in pain and terror as it flew through the air towards the bridge of death. The platypus bobbled slightly and put a webbed foot up to its head. Ow! Did you even try to miss? The bridge keeper rushed back to the escarpment. The rabbit sneered at the platypus. The platypus watched the bridge keeper approach and looked over his shoulder at the rabbit. You're despicable! July 16th. Dogbert jumped the rabbit and wrestled it to the ground. Holding the rabbit in half Nelson, he muzzled the rabbit's mouth with his free paw. The platypus calmly turned to face the bridge keeper. The mountain and the bird silently watched. The slug whimpered plaintively as it strained to crawl out of the platypus's fur. The bridge keeper looked around, noticing the still of the scene. He pulled a small book out of his tunic and thumbed through the pages, pointing to a spot on one of the pages. He looked up expectantly. Raising an eyebrow for emphasis. He looked down at the page again and strained his eyes to read it. Finally, he spoke. Mowage, that blessed arrangement that brings us together. With a start, he looked down at the book again. Oops, this isn't a wedding. He thumbed furiously through the pages again. Hmm, let me see. Quinceañeras, bar mitzvahs, funerals. Better mark that page. I might need it in a moment. Exorcisms, confrogations, ah, there we are. He looked up at his audience confidently. July 17th. The bridge keeper looked sternly at the platypus. What is your quest? The platypus quivered nervously. He looked over his shoulder at Dogbert. Dogbert nodded bravely. The platypus gulped and spoke. To reconcile the lockbox with poor Poe Mr. Bill. 
The bridge keeper looked down at his book again. What is the capital of Syria? The platypus put his webbed foot up to his chin. The capital of the fourth Assyrian Empire was Nineveh. Ashurbanipal was the capital of the third Assyrian Empire. The bridge keeper smiled slightly. That's enough. Let's move on. The platypus sighed. The bridge keeper raised his hand up. What is the airspeed velocity of a swallow? The platypus stepped forward. Would that be a European swallow or an African swallow? The bridge keeper advanced courageously. European. The cruising speed of a European swallow is 8 meters per second, the platypus replied. The high-speed flight of a European swallow is 11 meters per second, he continued. The bridge keeper stepped back in awe. The platypus continued. Therefore, the average airspeed velocity of a European swallow is, in American terms, 24 miles per hour. The slug slipped out of the platypus's fur and fell onto the bridge, but passed between the planks and descended into the gorge of eternal peril. Wah! Unseeing, the bridge keeper gestured towards the span of the bridge and said, Right, off you go. July 18th, intermission, music playing. July 19th, intermission, music playing. July 20th, intermission, music playing. July 23rd, an MC walked across an unlit stage and stood in front of a lonely microphone stand. The curtain behind him rose to reveal Lionel Jeffries marching around in the darkness in a silly dance-like manner. The MC looked down over his shoulder nervously and rubbed his hands on his argyle sweater. Ahem, <clears throat> he said into the microphone. He thumped it with his knuckles. Footnote. At this point, we were told that our exception processing reconciliations were effectively the accepted process for the company, but that management hadn't signed off on a business case for it yet. Lionel Jeffries shouted from behind him, Every bursted bubble has a glory. Each abysmal failure makes a point. A bright spotlight lit up the MC. He pulled at his collar and began to speak. Having succeeded in leading his entourage to the bridge of death, Dogbert was frustrated by his inability to maintain behavioral control over his companions. Lionel Jeffries continued to chant behind him. Every glowing path that goes astray shows you how to find a better way. The MC continued, despite the successful testing of the platypus's competence, Dogbert completely lost command of his entourage and the group fell into chaos, resulting in the near-fatal wounding of the slug when he fell into the gorge of eternal peril. So every time you stumble, never grumble. Next time you'll bumble even less. Lionel Jeffries began to sing, for up from the ashes grow the roses of success. The slug's voice rang out from the PA system. I'm feeling much better. I think I'll go for a walk. July 24th. Up from the ashes of disaster grow the roses of success. The privy councillor from Baron Bomber's castle stepped up to Lionel Jeffries and insisted, A car floating on the water. Never in all my days. Ain't seen nothing like it. The MC turned around to watch him in stupefied wonder. Dogbert stood behind him, bristling in a blind rage. Lionel Jeffries pulled his safari hat off and tucked it under his armpit. For every big mistake you make be grateful. That mistake you'll never make again. Every shiny dream that fades and dies generates the steam for two more tries. The MC tapped him on the shoulder and asked, Why are you singing this awful song from your movie? Lionel Jeffries put his safari hat back on and answered, We're offering commentary from Chitty Chitty Bang Bang on your situation. You see, the Langoliers are getting closer. Your characters are out of sync with their timeline. Can't talk now. I'm off for tea with the Maharaja. He tucked his umbrella under his armpit and marched into his tiny phone booth-sized phone booth hut. Not listening, Dogbert, Dogbert hissed, As soon as I master the art of pan searing, I'm going to introduce you to a skillet and an onion. The MC turned around, looked down at Dogbert, and suppressed a snicker. As soon as I master the art of baking, I'll introduce you to an oven and a cheesecloth. July 25th. Inappropriate content has been omitted from today's narration. Dogbert leaped at... Dot, dot, dot. Dot, dot, dot. The MC straightened his argyle sweater and righted his hat. July 26th. The platypus looked up. Am I a bear? 
Am I a whale soaring through the upper atmosphere of Magrathea, muttering, Oh no, not again? Am I a cactus? The mountain gasped. What's happening to the platypus? The bird rushed up to the bridge. Oh no, he's becoming a mixed metaphor. The platypus sputtered. Supercalifragicexpialidocious. The mountain frowned. It looks debilitating. Does it hurt? The bird held up its wing. He's lost his identity. It's like being undercaffeinated on a Monday morning. He may even lose consciousness. The slug groaned. At least he's not invisible. I'll know when to scamper away if he falls off the bridge at my head. Maybe he should re recite from some self-affirmations, suggested the bridgekeeper. The mountain scowled. Like what? The platypus smirked. I am not a duck? The mountain grimaced. That sounds more like negation to me. The beetle just chuckled. Yeah, but he's right. July 31st. The platypus stood motionless on the bridge, perilously waving between falling into the bridge and drifting haplessly out into space. The mountain peered over the edge of the crevice and shouted, Hey, little buddy, are you okay down there? The slug's voice echoed out from the depths of the Gorge of Eternal Peril. Yeah, me and Beetlejuice are just going to sit down here and try not to think about gravity. The bridgekeeper stepped back in fear. It's not contagious, is it? I hocked a loogie at the pawn shop last week and got 20 bucks for it, the platypus sputtered. When I went back to redeem it, they said it was unforgivable. The lockbox did a double take. Huh? The platypus whimpered. I think I'm losing my mind. You can't lose something you never had, the bird snapped. Huh? The lockbox asked again. He blew his nose, the slug explained. Dogbert stepped up, licking his fur remorsefully. Yow! Those British historians sure do pack a wallop. August 1st. At Pandemonium's kitchen, the Lord of Swamp Castle sat down next to the swamp, wincing from the pain in his leg and swarming away from a cloud of mosquitoes that had begun to hover near him. The senator asked Chef Ramsey to bring a phone to the table. The bill sang body songs in the bubbles of the paint. When Chef Ramsey returned with the phone, the corporal asked what it was for. The senator ignored him and dialed a number. After a few moments, the senator listened for a second and asked, Is your refrigerator running? Then you'd better go catch it. He hung up the phone harshly while laughing hysterically. He picked the handset up again, dialed another number, and waited for an answer again. This time he asked, Do you have Prince Albert in a can? Unable to stifle his curiosity any longer, the corporal interrupted, Who are you calling? The senator smirked. The Oval Office. The senator lunged at the senator's arm, trying to take the phone away from him. The senator straightened his other arm and pushed away at the corporal's face. Unimpressed, the Lord of Swamp Castle turned to the swamp and asked, Have you ever tried lighting some citronella candles? The swamp sharply replied, Ah, I don't go for that occult stuff. The Lord of Swamp Castle retorted, This isn't mysticism, it's aromatherapy. You reek of mosquito clouds. The senator dialed another number. August 2nd. Dogbert stormed up to the platypus. What childhood crisis are we live reliving now? The platypus turned its head to look Dogbert in the eyes. I had to claw my way out of an eggshell when I was born. Singing the happy, happy, joy, joy song is painfully cathartic for me. Dogbert turned to the mountain and the bird. What's wrong with this picture? The mountain looked over at the escarpment. My little buddy is down there. Dogbert stepped up to the edge. As he looked down, the phone began to ring. Dogbert jumped backward in fright. The bridgekeeper stepped up to the rid railing and picked up the phone. Ninth century bridgekeeper here, how may, how may I direct your call? He listened for a moment. Yes, I'm near a phone, but what good would that do? He listened again for a moment and then held the phone towards Dogbert. It's for you. August 6th. Dogbert took the phone from the bridgekeeper and held it against his ear. Yes, he listened for a moment and then replied. A flea collar. What are you wearing, sir? After a second of waiting, he groaned sharply and exclaimed, I can't believe I fell for that. The voice over the phone could be faintly heard bellowing, You fell for the oldest trick in the book! Dogbert snickered painfully. Okay, what's going on? What? That's enough goofing around. What's up, sir? He listened attentively, a look of growing alarm crossing his face. The mountain leaned forward. Hey, that looks painful. Are you okay? Dogbert said, Yes, sir, into the phone. Then he followed with, Sorry, sir, I won't let it happen again. He handed the phone to the bridgekeeper who accepted it, took a large bite out of it, and then hung it on the bridge railing. August 7th. Chef Ramsay stood calmly beside the table while the senator and the corporal struggled over the phone. The 
Corporal finally wrested the receiver from the senator's grip. He looked up at Chef Ramsay while brushing his hair aside. Thank you, Chef. That will be all. Chef Ramsay replied, I'll come back for the phone later. Just remember, it's not a mouth toy. He bowed slightly and walked towards the kitchen. Click. Ow. No, sorry. Clack. Ow. Who left an open bear trap in the walkway? The Lord of the Swamp Castle raised his hand meekly. Oops, that would be me. Sorry, my bad. August 9th. Dogbert stepped back from the edge of the Gorge of Eternal Peril. An aggressive, crunching sound could be faintly heard in the distance. Listen up, guys. We are out of sync with our timeline. The Langoliers are getting close to us as, we're, as we stand here. Supposed to already be going back to the States. The rabbit raised his hand meekly. We could go back to Camelot. The bridgekeeper scoffed. No, it is a silly place. Dogbert held up his phone in concern. You see, the problem with our situation is that the Bridge of Death scene is near the end of the Monty Python movie. How am I supposed to get out of here? The slug asked. There's a layer of salt limestone in the wall. The mountain peered over the edge. You'll have to work at it. It burns! Dogbert buried his face in his paws and shouted, Put some elbow grease into it. I don't have elbows. Put your nose to the grindstone, then. I don't have a nose. August 10th and August 11th. The platypus made a few whimpering noises. My calf muscles are starting to cramp up. Dogbert stepped up to the edge of the Gorge of Eternal Peril. You need to hurry. We're trying to outrun the Langoliers. The slug whimpered. I can't crawl more than a foot. The salty limestone layer makes me let go. Dogbert shouted. We're trying to figure out how to get back in sync with our timeline up here. You'll have to burn the midnight oil. It burns! Suppressing yelps of agony, the platypus clenched its teeth. Leaning against a nearby ice machine, the rabbit munched a carrot insolently. The bird ran up to the mountain and suggested, Maybe you could climb down there and rescue your friend. The mountain backed away fearfully. It's too steep. My ice cap might get stuck between the stony cracks. Dogbert wrung his paws in aggravation. You're a 20,000 foot tall mountain. It's only a mile deep chasm. The mountain hid its face in shame. I'm afraid of heights. The platypus began to make noises like an angry squirrel. Can I please put my foot down? The suppressed whimpers of the platypus had... Oh, sorry. 8.13. August 13th. The suppressed whimpers of the platypus had become stifled yelps of agony. Squirrels around the globe stood up to take notice, shaking their heads in sympathy and despair. The Langoliers continued to chomp away at England's, England's past noisily. The rabbit continued to eat his carrot, occasionally wondering why it was making so much noise while he was eating it. The bird noticed the rabbit's concern and suggested, An old friend of mine told me that if you listen carefully while you eat certain vegetables, you can hear them screaming in agony. The rabbit took his paw off the ice machine and pointed at the carrot. I don't think that's screaming. I think that it's cheering. Dogbert paced nervously, racking his brain. What was the name of the castle at the end of the movie? Between whimpers, the platypus offered, they spent a lot of time in a cave trying to figure out how to pronounce it because it was a French name. August 14th. Dogbert stepped up to the platypus and pointed, You remember that? What did they say? The platypus, struggling to remain balanced on one foot, scraped his throat while turning towards Dogbert. Back of the throat, alarm and surprise. Dogbert fumed, that doesn't help me much. What do you take me for, a fool? The platypus returned its gaze to the span of the bridge of death and answered morosely, you are a semicircle in the loop-de-loops of life. Dogbert's fur turned dark red as steam bellowed from his ears. As the steam dissipated and his color calmed down to white again, he stared at the platypus with a puzzled look. The rabbit smirked while swallowing a mouthful of carrot. Tsk, tsk, tsk. Dobbert walked over to the rabbit. Suddenly, I'm starting to find you a bit more tolerable. August 15th. Platypus began to sweat profusely while whimpering loudly. My bones ache. The slug slithered toward, under Beetlejuice's feet. Hair. Hey, watch where you drip that stuff. It has salt in it, you know. The mountain looked down into the gorge of eternal peril dizzily. Say, maybe you could get Beetlejuice to throw you up there. I'll catch you up here. I'll catch you. Trust me, I'm your friend. Beetle just looked up. I hocked a loogie at the pawn shop last week and they said it was unforgivable. I'm not looking forward to that again. 
The slave turned sharply. I am not a loogie. The platypus glass glanced down into the gorge. I was wondering what prompted me to say that earlier. His foot wavered. Oops, I shouldn't have looked down. The bird stepped up. You dance like a slug. Don't you have something incomprehensible, meaningful, meaningful to say? Dogbert stepped over to the lockbox and knocked fitfully on one of its iron panels. Hello, McFly. Anybody home? August 20th. The lockbox rose up, startled. Dogbert stepped back dutifully. The lockbox raised its hand attentively. While we are waiting for the Langoliers to eat us, I will tell you a story. It is a story of Cygnus X-1, Book 2. The rabbit looked forward defiantly. Wait a minute, what happened to Book 1? The lockbox looked down sadly. It was rambling and incoherent. The only way to appreciate it properly was with the music that was written for it. The bird per perked up. Oh boy, do we get to sing the song? August 21st. The lockbox settled down on the rocks for a moment. No, you can't sing it, but you can play act it if you like. Dogbert, Dogbert scowled at the lockbox. August 21st. The lockbox settled down on the rocks for a moment. No, you can't sing it, but you can play act it if you like. Dogbert scowled at the lockbox and turned expectantly towards the bird. The bird did a double take and then thought for a moment. Okay, I can do this. The bird cupped its wings together as though portraying a small space, steadily shrinking, then furrowed its brow while shielding its eyes and pretended to look up at the sky. Holding its wings in front of itself, the bird made whirring noises and puttered around near the bridge. After making a few circles, the bird intentionally stumbled onto the ground and rolled in a heap down into the gorge of eternal peril. Dogbert has raised a paw in defiance, but dropped it in wonder. Wow, I couldn't have hoped for better. The mountain looked over the edge of the escarpment and asked, Are you okay? Do you see my little buddy down there? I don't hear any applause up there, the bird shouted. The lockbox shrugged. Okay, so interpretive dance isn't our strong suit. Maybe I should just quote the lyrics. August 22nd. The lockbox rose up authoritatively, raising its arms up to calm its listeners. The platypus spun around on one foot, struggling to maintain balance. Dogbert sat restfully in a, grass, in a grassy patch and gnawed listlessly on a pork bone. The mountain politely scooted around behind the bird and the rabbit. The rabbit tucked its carrot into its armpit and folded his arms attentively. Beetlejuice hoisted himself up onto the escarpment and rested his chin on his folded arms. The slug skittered away from the bird's frenetic pecking. The lockbox scanned its audience and then pointed at the platypus sharply. Stop that! You look like a Captain Morgan's commercial. The bridgekeeper looked stunned as he gestured to himself questioningly. Then he glanced down at the platypus and began to snicker fiendishly. The platypus put his foot down and fell to his knees. Owie! I feel like Ralph Macchio in that movie. August 23rd. The lockbox settled down on the ground. The prelude reads like this. When our weary, weary world was young, the struggle of the ancients first began. The gods of love and reason sought alone to rule the fate of man. They battled through the ages, but still neither force, force would yield. The people were divided, every soul a battlefield. The platypus scratched its chin. I remember that scene in the cave of Carabinog when they passed, when they guessed that it might be the castle of Camarg. Dogbert scowled. Shh, this is story time. Didn't you attend elementary school? August 24th. Ignoring the interruption, the lockbox continued. Apollo, the bringer of wisdom, came to the people of Earth and said, I bring truth and understanding. I bring wit and wisdom fair, precious gifts beyond compare. We can build a world of wonder. I can make you all aware. I will find you food and shelter, show you fire to keep you warm through the endless winter storm. You can live in grace and comfort in the world that you transform. The people were delighted, coming forth to claim their prize. They ran to build their cities and converse among the wise. But one day the streets fell silent, yet they knew not what was wrong. The urge to build these fine things seemed not to be so strong. The wise men were consulted and the bridge of death was crossed in quest of Dionysus to find out what they had lost. It's all about this bridge of death thing, isn't it? The platypus heckled. 
You think we shouldn't have come here at all, don't you? August 27th. Dogbert hushed the platypus. The lockbox continued. Dionysus, the bringer of love, came to the people and said, I bring love to give you solace in the darkness of the night. In the heart's eternal light, you need only trust your feelings. Only love can stir you right. I bring laughter, I bring music, I bring joy, and I bring tears. I will soothe your primal fears. Throw off those chains of reason and your prison disappears. The cities were abandoned, and the forests echo song. They danced and lived as brothers. They knew love could not be wrong. Food and wine they had a plenty, and they slept beneath the stars. The people were contented, and the gods watched from afar. But the winter fell upon them, and it caught them unprepared, bringing wolves and cold starvation, and the hearts of men despaired. August 28th. Don't shush me, the platypus retorted. We're in real danger, and you want me to contentedly sit and listen to stories? The lockbox cleared its throat, paused, and then continued to speak. The universe divided as the heart and mind collided, with the people left unguided for so many troubled years, in a cloud of doubts and fears, their world was torn asunder into hollow hemispheres. Some fought themselves, some fought each other, some just followed one another, lost and aimless like their brothers, for their hearts were so unclear, and the truth could not appear. Their spirits were divided into blinded hemispheres. Dogbert hastily interrupted, the Langoliers can't get us as long as we stay here. It's a semantic safety net. The lockbox scowled at Dogbert, then looked around at the others. Some who did not fight brought tales of old to light. My Rosinante sailed by night on her final flight. To the heart of Cygnus' fearsome force we set our course, spiraled through that timeless space to this immortal place. The rabbit stepped away from the ice machine and moved closer to the gorge of eternal peril. Do you think we might be even safer down there with the slug and the bird? Beetlejuice shouted. Well, I'd certainly be a little less lonely, the slug added. You're sure to be a lot less allergic to salt than I am. The lockbox picked up a glass of tea and sipped from it listlessly. Are you through yet? The mountain smug smiled smugly. I was being quiet. The lockbox coughed in annoyance and then said it the tea glass down and raised his arms as though preaching. Cygnus spoke to the people. I have memory and awareness, but I have no shape or form. As a disembodied spirit, I am dead and yet unborn. I have passed into Olympus, as was told in tales of old, to the city of immortals, marble white and purest gold. I see the gods in battle rage on high, thunderbolts across the sky. I cannot move, I cannot hide. I feel a silent scream begin inside. The lockbox slowly lowered its arms and waited. The rabbit chomped eagerly on the carrot and quipped, Ooh, I can taste the suspense. August 30th. The lockbox rose up, raising its arms threateningly and shouted, Then all at once the chaos ceased. A stillness fell. A sudden peace. The warriors felt my silent cry and stayed their struggle, mystified. Apollo was astonished. Dionysus thought me mad. But they heard my story further, and they wondered, and were sad. Looking down from Olympus on a world of doubt and fear, its surface splintered into sorry hemispheres. They sat a while in silence, then they turned at last to me. We will call you Cygnus, the god of balance you shall be. The rabbit dropped the carrot as his jaw dropped. Well, gee, that's kind of anticlimactic. The lockbox lowered its arms and explained, Well, it's not done yet. This last part, called the sphere, is a kind of dream. Cygnus went to the people and said, We can walk our road together if our goals are all the same. We can run alone and free if we pursue a different aim. Let the truth of love be lighted. Let the love of truth shine clear. Sensibility, armed with sense and liberty, with the heart and mind united in a single, perfect sphere. That is the end of the song. P.S. Lyrics copyrighted 1978 by Getty Lee, Neil Peart, and Alex Lifeson. August 31st and September 1st. Dogbert stormed up to the rabbit. What do you mean anticlimactic? It has a very reassuring denouement. The rabbit shrugged defensively. It's such a silly conclusion. Just say be sane. 
If only all our problems could go away by saying, I have balance. Even my tires aren't that stable. The bird flew up out of the gorge of eternal peril and lighted beside the mountain. Say, did anyone want to help rescue the slug, or are we just going to keep arguing about nothing? The rabbit did a double take. Oh, I have an idea. This will work. I know it. I saw it in a Tom and Jerry cartoon. The mountain shrugged in despair. Well, where have I heard that before? The rabbit stepped over to the ice machine and slapped it on the side. Here, we'll just fill the gorge with ice cubes to raise the floor past the limestone layer. The platypus looked down despairingly. Speaking of unstable... September 4th. GL-1003 Recon is waiting patiently at the shoreline. The rabbit started flinging ice cubes at the platypus. Each one hitting the platypus... Each one hit the platypus, bounced off the planks of the gorge of a bridge of death, and fell into the gorge of eternal peril. This would go a lot faster if I had help. The platypus held up its webbed feet to protect its face. I realize that you're goal-oriented, but could you please actualize your targeting on somebody else? The slug shrieked and skittered under Beetlejuice's feet. The mountain stifled, sniffled meekly and turned away. The bird hopped around the foothills and looked closely at the mountain's face. Why are you crying? Dogbert stepped up cautiously. What's wrong? The bird looked around. I don't know. It isn't hay fever. The lockbox spoke up. He has message envy. The mountain sobbed loudly. I've always dreamed of zero equals zero for a quarter of a million years. I've tried to reconcile myself with vertigo, but I'm just too tall. The rabbit stopped throwing ice cubes and put its paws on its hips. Gee, this is great. It's not enough to be agoraphobic, is it? September 7th and September 8th. Reality observation. I frequently reread previous passages of the story during bus rides as I am coming to work so that I can keep up with staging and direction. The other day I was rereading from the arrival of the rabbit onward. When I got up from my seat to get off at my stop, the guy sitting next to me quickly asked, Does the platypus ever cross the bridge of death? I turned around and answered, Not yet. He has passed the bridge keeper's test, but he is still standing on the bridge. September 10th. At Pandemonium's kitchen, a tallish man wearing a black trench coat walked in carrying a laptop computer. He plopped it decisively on the maitre d's podium and opened it. After a few keystrokes and mouse movements, he stepped back, watched for a moment, and then stepped around beside the left side of the laptop. Can you see me now? he asked. The maitre d', who had been watching in astonishment, suddenly claimed, Al Gore, it's you! The man in the trench coat smirked and replied, No, I'm not Al Gore, but I am famous. He walked around behind the laptop and stopped again. Can you see me now? Just then, a young man in a filthy apron dashed out of the kitchen and slapped a placard on the podium next to the laptop. He looked around fearfully and then slowly limped back into the kitchen. The maitre d' looked around at the placard. It said, Beware of flying bear traps. September 11th. The man in the black trench coat moved across to the right side of the laptop. Stopping there, he said, Can you see me now? The maitre d' looked incredulously as the man closed the laptop unceremoniously and strolled past him towards the table. The man in the black trench coat sat down next to the corporal and opened his laptop again. Chef Ramsay appeared instantly at his side. The man looked up and said, I'll have the special. Chef Ramsay nodded quickly and strolled away at a maddening pace. The senator dropped his spoon and stared at the man in the black trench coat. Noticing this, the man looked straight ahead and sternly spoke in even measured tones. No, I am not Al Gore. Don't even start with that. The swamp dropped a frog leg bone in dismay. The lord of swamp castle looked from side to side, wondering what he was missing. The bill squirmed fitfully in the can of lead-based paint. Finally, the man in the black trench coat looked over at the senator and asked, Are you going to eat that? September 12th. Blorgle, the bill sputtered. Pugnafwibble, Meglanot. The man in the black trench coat grabbed a spoon and began sipping nervously at the senator's rabbit stew. He asked, what's wrong with these, those papers in that paint can? The swamp shrugged helplessly. He's been drinking lead-based paint. He decided to take a swim in it. The man slurped another spoonful. Mmm, this is good. It's got a little kick to it. The senator rolled his eyes in disdain. The corporal held up his hand. Whoa, Mr. Verizon Wireless Internet Video Phone Guy. You're going to spill that stuff on your laptop when you find out what it is. 
The man in the black trench coat froze in mid-slurp and looked up. Just then, Chef Ramsay appeared beside him with a large platter. You're special, sir, he suddenly laughed nervously and waved defensively. I mean, I don't mean that you're special, but I meant that the special that you ordered is here. I hope you like it. It's a flying bear trap on a bed of rice with a caramelized wine sauce. I would recommend treating it like an uncooked lobster. The bill tumbled out of the paint can and sprawled across the table. September 14th and September 15th. The man in the black trench coat looked warily at the flying bear, bear trap platter. Distractedly, he spoke across the table. I don't represent Verizon. I represent Sprint. Keeping his eyes on the bear trap, he placed the senator's spoon in the rabbit stew. Speaking of which, I think that would be a good thing for me to do right about now. The corporal interrupted. Wait, if you were the Sprint guy, wouldn't you look more like Elvis Costello? The man in the black trench coat stepped up from the chair and stood behind it. He looked perplexed and turned sideways. Can you see me now? Suddenly he sprinted away through the foyer doors and disappeared into the streets. Seconds later the phone rang. The senator answered, Hello? The voice on the other end said, Can you see me now? The senator retorted, You forgot your laptop. September 17th. The senator solemnly placed the phone back on the switch hook, looking at it oddly as he released his grip on it. The corporal looked at him and then returned his gaze to the flying bear trap platter. The Lord of Swap Castle turned from the window and stared morosely at the flying bear trap platter. The swamp brushed away at the mosquitoes as it tried to keep its gaze fixed on the flying bear trap platter. The bill sputtered incoherently on the table between snores, an occasional splatter of lead-based paint spraying up from its mouth. Chef Ramsay stepped up gingerly and paused in an awkward silence. Finally, he spoke. Well, that seems to have done the job. Would anyone like some coffee? All eyes moved slowly up to Chef Ramsay's face for a long stare. Then simultaneously, everyone jumped under the table. Chef Ramsay smirked and said, Then I'll just take the phone away from you and I'll come back later. September 19th. The rabbit began to pelt the platypus with ice cubes again. The bridge keeper stepped up to the mountain and asked, Why don't you just shake your head really hard and drop your snow cap into the gorge of eternal peril? The mountain suppressed a, stif a sniffle and looked at the bridge keeper. You mean intentionally have an a avalanche? The bird scratched its head. What would that be like? A migraine? Defoliating? Dogbert stomped in exasperation. There is no public defoliating allowed at the Bridge of Death. Where is your sense of propriety? The slug hollered from the bottom of the Gorge of Eternal Peril. Hey, it's starting to get really cold down here. September 25th. The crunching sound of the Langoliers became noticeably louder. The rabbit climbed up to the, on the ice machine and scanned the horizon. It looks like there's only one Langolier heading for us. Are we really safe here? Dogbert looked at the, up at the rabbit. Yes, this place is eternally perilous. That means the danger can never actually arrive. The rabbit shrugged and began to throw ice cubes at the platypus again. The platypus lay haplessly on the bridge of death, flinching at any impact. The slug whimpered from the depths of the gorge of eternal peril. Okay, I've <laughs> had enough. Achoo! The mountain leaned forward helplessly. Stop throwing those ice cubes. You're hurting the slug and the platypus. I have a reputation to live down to. Besides, why should you care, Mountain? The rabbit sneered. You'll perish too when the Langoliers get here. The Mountain did a double take. I am not a temporary condition caused by poor training. I am a persistent problem. I shall never pass away. The lockbox rose up beside the Mountain. That's not really something to be proud of, you know. September 26th. At Pandemonium's condition, kitchen, Chef Ramsay strode briskly out of the kitchen with a phone on a silver tray. He stopped at the table and knocked on it aggressively. The corporal's head appeared out from under the tablecloth. Chef Ramsay looked down and said, There's a phone call for the senator. The senator poked his head out and glanced furtively at the flying bear trap platter, then turned his eyes up to Chef Ramsay. Who is it? Chef Ramsay picked up the receiver and held it up. I believe it's the rabbit, sir. 
The senator jerked in surprise and held up his hands in a protective gesture. Shh, you didn't tell him that I'm eating rabbit stew, did you? Chef Ramsey glanced sneakily at the receiver and answered, No, I didn't tell him. The swamp crawled out from under the table and looked out the window. Who was that man in the black trench coat? Hugh Grant stepped up, pretending to be dressed like a Secret Service agent. Good evening, he said. That was not Al Gore, pretending to be the guy in the Verizon wire commercials doing dialogue from the Sprint commercials. The swamp shrugged decisively. I knew it. He was an imposter. September 28th and September 29th. Dogbert stomped up to the ice machine angrily. What are you up to now, rabbit? The rabbit held the mouthpiece of the phone up to his face and held his paw out defensively. Shh! Can't you see I'm on the phone? You're only on half a phone, Dogbert fumed. The lockbox floated over to the mountain's side and chided, You have issues, don't you? The mountain leaped backward. No, I'm a normal problem. I'm not crazy. The rabbit looked at the phone. I haven't got an earpiece here, so I can't hear anything you say. I just wanted to tell you that Poe Mr. Bill is an impractical solution to a misunderstood problem, and the only reason people respect it is because of its ability to burst into flames. At pandemonium's condition, the senator took the phone, held it fearfully, muttering, I didn't touch it, rabbit, I swear. The chef spilled web-based paint in it, and I couldn't eat it. Oh, please don't hurt me. He picked up a glass of water and sipped from it nervously. Chef Ramsey snickered. The bridge keeper must have bitten off the earpiece. He couldn't hear what we said. The senator heaved a sigh of relief, then put the phone up to his ear. After a few seconds, he shouted angrily, What? He slammed the water glass on the table, smacking the platter on the edge. The platter catapulted the flying bear trap out through the window. October 3rd. Dogbird exploded in an expression of shock. Who were you talking to? The rabbit leaped down from the ice machine. The senator. I had to offend him so that he would smack something down on the table near the platter, failing to miss it. Dogbert stepped forward, scowling ferociously, as if your existence doesn't offend him enough. The rabbit shrugged. What? He's eating rabbit stew. I think I can afford a little righteous indignation. Meanwhile, at Pandemonium's ki kitchen, the senator stood beside Chef Ramsay, a look of amazement washing across his face. Ooh, that's going to cost me my re-election. The Lord of Swamp Castle leaned out from under the table, brushing bits of glass out of his hair. The senator called out harshly, Lemix, clonk! The corporal's head bounced off the underside of the table as he struggled to stand up to attention quickly. Several water glasses toppled over, spilling across the tablecloth. The bill continued to snore lazily. The corporal finally stood upright and saluted dutifully, Sir, yes, sir! Regaining his composure, the senator turned and said, Lemix, I think we need to gather an ops team to send to the Bridge of Death. October 12th and October 13th, Dogbert stood impatiently, glaring angrily at the rabbit. The mountain sulked noisily beside the ice machine while the bird made unnoticed attempts to console the mountain. The platypus leaned on the railing of the bridge of death, panting and wheezing in pain from the welts left by the numerous ice cubes the rabbit had thrown at him. The lockbox hovered majestically over the bridge of eternal, over the gorge of eternal peril. Beetle just rested on his elbows over the edge of the escarpment. The slug squirmed around the floor of the Gorge of Eternal Peril, trying to remember how to use the magic hat. The bridge keeper loitered beside the Bridge of Death, occasionally kicking Beetlejuice in the head. The rabbit arrogantly tossed an ice cube at Dogbert. Dogbert sidestepped and raised his fist at the rabbit. You give me no choice, rabbit. This means war. The rabbit turned around and quipped, Hey, that's supposed to be my line. Platypus raised a claw slightly, or mine. October 19th. Dogbert fumed at the rabbit, who was still lobbing ice cubes at him. You've been rebelliously interfering with our efforts since you arrived, the rabbit sneered. I'd much rather be chastised for failing to excel than applauded for a consistent mediocrity. The slug floated gingerly above Beetlejuice's head. I think I've got the hang of this, he shouted. Ignoring the slug, Dogbert shouted, You are endangering us all. The rabbit lobbed another ice cube and smirked, I'd much rather be in real danger than snuggle with eternal peril at no actual risk. The mountain sobbed, Will you two stop fighting? Dogbert grimaced, Shut up, you're the poster child for claymation. The rabbit snickered, 
Oh, that's motivating. October 26th. The slug wafted gently in the air, air over the bridge keeper's head. Hey, look, everybody, I'm flying. The mountain looked over and gasped, hiding its eyes in horror. Don't look down, you're afraid of flying. The bird flew away into the clouds. Now that's com unusual and completely unexpected, the rabbit sneered. Dogbert turned around slowly and rested his hands on his hips. Finally, somebody here is beginning to act sensibly. The platypus guffawed vigorously. Heh, <laughs> sensibly? A sudden chomp rang out from the edge, edge of the ridge. The slug wavered nervously. Ah, they're here! Dogbert spun around in terror. Where are the Pac-Man ghosties when you need them? October 29th. As he stood courageously in the center of the plane's cargo bay, the senator checked his flight suit to make sure the parachute straps were secure. Tell me, he asked the corporal, why did the president use expressions like lame brain, cockamamie, and infantile while discussing this mission? Clinging fearfully to the frame brackets, the corporal answered, because he's trying to discourage the Chinese government from using Chinese lead-based paint in its toy-making factories. His vice president is known for hunting accidents, and you have suddenly come to represent the kind of pathological indifference that he wants the American public to forget that his government is rife with. The senator shrugged. Ah, politics. I thought he was referring to the mission when he was saying those things. But he was talking about me, eh? The corporal looked warily out the cargo bay door. Then he turned to look at the senator again. You must be so proud. The senator slapped the corporal on the shoulder. Hey, don't be so modest. You've earned your place here, too. The senator leaned closer to the corporal's face. So, tell me again why we, why, why we are the only two people on this mission. The corporal replied, Because the president used words like lame brain, cockamamie, and infantile while describing your request to the Joint Chiefs of Staff. The corporal jumped out of the plane. The senator shrieked, Wait! Don't leave me! How am I supposed to accomplish this mission alone? A voice from the plane's cockpit bellowed, Sir! We're over the drop zone! You have to go! Now! The senator looked out through the cargo bay door. Lummox! November 1st. Dogbert charged the ice machine eight violently. The rabbit fearlessly stood on top of it, wagging his paw in a disciplinary, disciplinarily chiding manner. Dogbert pounded on the sides of the ice machine, shouting, The senator will be here soon, and you'll rue the day you crossed me. The rabbit laughed heartily. Oh, how trite you are. A brown bear popped its head above the escarpment beside the bridge. Beetle just looked over and said hello. The slug wavered above the bridge railing, struggling to move laterally. But hey, we've got to move. The rabbit jumped down from the ice machine and ran past Dogbert, ignoring his pugilistic stance. November 2nd. The senator jumped out of the plane, muttering lummox several times as he kept his hand tightly gripped on the pull cord handle. With a thud, he landed on top of a phone booth side hut, dangling from a hooked rope. Lionel Jeffries leaned out its window and shouted, You just dropped someone! The senator peered over the eaves of the hut and complained, Shouldn't you be reading a story to your grandkids? Lionel Jeffries put his hand to his chin and muttered, It took us twenty takes to get that scene right. I kept laughing at the thought of a big brown bear lolloping across an entire, the entire width of a mountain. You're another lummox, the senator slid off the roof of the hut and continued his descent. Why do I have to live in a world populated by lummoxes? Meanwhile, at the bridge of death, the Langoliers were hungrily chomping at the edge of the ridge. The rabbit dashed across the bridge, ignoring the platypus's fe feeble movements. Perplexed, the big brown bear looked over at Beetlejuice. The lockbox drifted safely across the gorge of eternal peril beside the bridge, grabbing one of the slug's eye stalks. Ow! Dogbert stood vacantly in front of the ice machine with his paws up in front of him, poised at nobody. The mountain shouted above the noise, Wait, I haven't passed the test yet. I can't cross the bridge. The bridge keeper scampered towards the bridge. Dogbert looked around the side of the ice machine to see the approaching Langoliers. He shrieked fearfully and sprinted towards the bridge. <clears throat> November 5th. The porpoise paddled back and forth along the shoreline dejectedly. I'll bet they're waiting in a long line. I wish I could have gone with them. At least I could keep them awake during this, their boring wait. November 7th. The bridge keeper stopped at the escarpment 
of the bridge of death and turned around dutifully, resting his arm on the railing. He tried to look idle despite his growing terror. The mountains squirmed as though it were in dire need of a potty break. Wait, don't leave me here! Dogbert dashed past the bridge keeper. The lockbox sailed across the gorge of eternal peril, dragging the slug along by one of its eye stalks. The platypus raised up on its knees and began scooting backwards across the bridge. High above them, the senator slid off the top of Grandpa's hut and continued his descent. He quickly approached the corporal, who was straining to maintain a restful pose. The senator shouted, Look down! They're already here! The corporal scanned the ground far below them and pointed at the shiny Langler's backside. Are we too late? The mountain scooted towards the bridge of death, but halted in front of the bridge keeper. The bridge keeper stood his ground unflinchingly. Will you move? I have to cross now, the mountain barked. The bridge keeper smirked playfully and then held up his hand menacingly. Stop, he commanded. Who would cross the bridge of death must answer me these questions three, ere the other side he see. November 8th. The mountain suddenly stood motionless, looking at the bridge keeper in shock and wonder. The bridge keeper glanced over the crest of the mountain, eyeing the langolier that was beginning to chomp its way across the ridge towards the bridge of death. He nervously took a half step backward. The platypus stood up and ran across the bridge of death, screaming, Ah! They're coming right at us! as he ran. The bird lighted on the ground between Dogbert and the rabbit. Dogbert folded his arms scornfully, scowling at the rabbit. The rabbit playfully sang a traditional Irish folk song. There be sober men a plenty, and drunkards barely twenty. There were men of over ninety who have never yet kissed a girl. But give me the rambling rover, from Orkley down to Dover, we will roam the country over, and together we'll face the world. The big brown bear stared vacantly at the sky. November 9th. The lockbox swirled around behind Dogbert and looked over at the slug. The slug was wheezing painfully. The rabbit turned around and instructed, Binge and purge, binge and purge, that's it, you'll be okay. November 12th. The bridge keeper folded his arms and waited. The mountain glanced helplessly at Peterges, who shrugged diffidently and looked away. The brown bear turned its paws up in confusion and, and turned towards the bridge keeper. The bridge keeper gripped his shoulders nervously and paced from side to side. The corporal fell on the ridge beside the mountain with a messy thud. Once he had unfurled himself from the parachute's folds, the corporal saw the approaching Langolier and backed clumsily into the mountain's foothills. A yard gnome threw several snowballs at him in contempt, while the flamingos squawked above the clattering noise of their shaking kneecaps. The soldier drifted aimlessly downward, but the senator drifted aimlessly downward several hundred yards above the gorge of eternal peril. The corporal dove sheepish, sheepishly into the gorge. On the other side of the bridge of death, Dogbert and the rabbit comforted the slug. Phew, I almost thought we'd lost you that time. The slug rubbed its forehead and exhaled weakly. I think I can taste the underside of my toenails. November 13th. The mountain stepped forward aggressively, but the bridge keeper did not move. The corporal hopped up between Beetlejuice and the brown bear and looked at the approaching Langolier. He turned his eyes upward and watched the bridge keeper in the mountain. Then he turned to his side and grimaced at the sight of Beetlejuice. In disgust, he turned to look over his shoulder and jumped when he saw the bear sitting beside him. The phone booth-sized hut descended lower. Lionel Jeffries poked his head out of the window and looked down. The mountain scoffed and stepped aside. Lionel Jeffries gasped. The great big mountain lolloped over the brown bear. No, 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 Lionel Jeffries cried. The corporal fainted. Beetlejuice cheered while Dogbert, the bird, the rabbit, and the slug stood silently, their mouths hanging agape. The bridge keeper raised his hand to complain, but hesitated. With a horrendous thud, the mountain landed on the rough terrain on the other side of the bridge of death. November 15th. The senator pulled his ripcord and jolted into a slower descent. The mountain heaved a sigh of relief and glanced backward at the bridge keeper. The langolier continued to chomp its way across the bridge, the sound of crunching rocks roaring across the gorge of eternal peril. The bridge keeper leaned backward into the railing, trying to escape death by merely being out of reach from the langolier's teeth. Dogbert stepped over in front of the platypus. Now, what was the name of that castle that King Arthur and his knights went to after leaving the bridge of death scene? The platypus shrugged. Arg! The bridge keeper screamed as he sprinted across the bridge of death. 
Dogbert walked across to the bird and then the rabbit. Do any of you know the name of that castle at the end of the old Monty Python movie? You know, after they left the Bridge of Death and King Arthur gets arrested? The bird shook his head while the rabbit pushed Dogbert aside. The senator fell into the escarpment with a thwap and stood up quickly, cowering as the Langolier advanced on him. Just as the Langolier was about to close his, its jaws on the senator, the flying bear trap clamped down on the Langolier's backside. Arg! the Langolier whimpered. The senator fell backward onto the bridge of death, holding his arms fearfully over his face. Arg! he whimpered. The rabbit pounded his fist into his other paw. Arg! he shouted. Dick dastardly stood behind them, waving his arms angrily and shouted, Drat! Drat! And double drat! Muttley stood calmly beside him, covering his mouth with his paw, and snickered fiendishly. November 19th. Dogbert watched in amazement as the Langolier collapsed into feverish unconsciousness. The senator clambered backwards across the bridge of death, groping for the ropes to keep from falling between the sparsely placed flanks. Dogbert turned towards the rabbit in contempt and furtively kicked Dick Dastardly in the shin. He announced, Reality check! The rabbit quickly pulled a notepad out of his fur and held a pencil to it, scanning the list carefully. Sorry, fresh out. The mountain looked aghast at the slug who was radiating numbers in a spirally pattern. Look, what's happening to you, little buddy? The bird landed beside Muttley and stared dismissively at the slug. He's becoming a transcendental metaphor. If I know this process, he may even sprout wings and look like a butterfly. November 20th. The mountain stared in awe. Wow, I thought only worms could do that. The bird stepped closer to the slug. He's starting to look even more tasty, growing into the morsely goodness of transcendentalism. The slug grunted in discomfort. I can appreciate your admiration, but it really isn't any fun secreting all these numbers. Wearing the magic hat, the slug drifted off the ground and absentmindedly spread its wings. The rabbit smiled contentedly when he looked at them. They were bright, round, and gentle arrayed in pastel colors. The slug flapped its wings haplessly. And what am I supposed to do with these? They look like they've been transplanted from a care bearer. Dogbert clapped his paws authoritatively. Okay, we're still kicking, but we have an agenda. The slug stared imploringly at Dogbert until Dogbert grimaced silently, waiting for the slug to realize that help was not being offered. Finally, Dogbert spoke. Yes, they look very good on you. Now let's go. Footnote. Even when I was writing it, I wanted to use the word excreting here, but alas, these were emails written in a corporate atmosphere. The senator looked down into the gorge of eternal peril where the corporal lay sleeping on the bear's shoulder, then turned to look at Dogbert. Can we just leave him here? November 28th. The platypus stepped up to Dick Dastardly and quipped, Oh look, more cartoon characters. Hey rabbit, you should make them feel right at home here. Muttley stopped snickering and looked sharply at the platypus. Dogbert strolled past them and stood beside the senator. You'll have to go down there and pick him up. The senator frowned. But he's not my type. Dogbert mashed his paw into his face and stumbled dejectedly over to the mountain's foothills. That was a mighty leap you made back just then. Are you ready to move on now? The mountain broke his fearful stare at the unconscious Langolier and turned towards Dogbert. Are you kidding? The slug flittered up beside the mountain and quipped, It's brave enough to stare at a defeated adversary, but the real bravery is forgetting your victory over it. Dogbert looked over it, up at the slug angrily. Those are noble words, butterfly, but don't get all Jonathan Livingston Sealer on us. The senator clambered down the wall of the gorge of eternal peril to rescue the corporal. November 29th. <clears throat> The rabbit waved decisively, and on that note, we'll move on to bigger and better things. He stepped over to Dogbert and asked, Now, where is that castle that we are supposed to find? Dogbert scratched his forehead and mumbled something unintelligible. The bridge keeper walked over beside him, looking down in concern. Beetlejuice leaped out of the gorge of eternal peril and wafted beside the bridge keeper. Hey, can I go with you? Look, we're simpatico. We dress the same. Dogbert stomped on the bridge keeper's foot. The bridge keeper howled in agony. Arg! Dogbert looked over at the platypus expectantly and waited. The platypus shrugged. Dogbert walked away. November 30th. The rabbit strolled alongside Dogbert, singing playfully. 
when I'm traveling down the road and I'm flirting with disaster. I've got the pedal to the floor. My life is running faster. I'm out of money. I'm out of hope. It looks like self-destruction. Well, how much more can we take with all of this corruption? Been flirting with disaster. Y'all know what I mean. And the way we run our lives, it makes no sense to me. I don't know about yourself or what you want to be. Yeah. When we gamble with our time, we choose our destiny. The lockbox hurried behind Dogbert and asked, Where are we going to find that castle? We can't just wander into the wilderness not knowing what we are looking for. The mountain stumbled backwards away from the bridge of death while the slug flittered away in terror. The rabbit continued to sing. I'm traveling down that lonesome road. Feels like I'm dragging a heavy load. Yeah, I've tried to turn my head away. Feels about the same most every day. Speeding down the fast lane, playing from town to town, the boys and I have been burning it up. Can't seem to slow it down. I've got the pedals to the floor and our lives are running faster. Got our sights set straight ahead, but I ain't sure what we're after. December 3rd. Dogbert looked over at the rabbit. Rabbit, would you please muzzle yourself? The rabbit did a double take. No need. I'm done singing now. The bridge keeper hurried up behind Dogbert. Where are you going? Your friend needs help. Meanwhile, the senator was precariously dangling from the outcroppings of the gorge of eternal peril. Lummox, he shouted. Wake up! The corporal lay lifelessly across the bear's ribcage, drooling slightly into the bear's armpit. The senator turned back to the wall and continued to climb down. Lummox, 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 lummox. The langolier rolled fitfully and groaned. December 6th. Bored with waiting, the platypus swam up to Greenland and rested its snout on the edge of an iceberg. A fur seal hobbled out to the shoreline and asked, If Shrek took a dose of mucinex, would he disappear? The porpoise answered, Nope, to him it's a diuretic. If Princess Fiona took it, would she look like Cher? December 7th and December 8th. Hurrying behind the mountain, the slug muttered, My life came to fruition when I realized that NASCAR racing is nothing more than a bunch of guys making four left turns a few hundred times in a row. The mountain looked up and smiled and responded, It's nice to know that we're getting away from all that hostility-based humor. Looking over his shoulder, Dogbert pondered, it is? I mean, we are? The corporal rolled off the bear's midsection and opened his eyes. Huh? What? I'm alive? He stood up sharply and wobbled a bit. The senator dropped off the wall and landed on the corporal's shoulders. Not knowing that the langolier was nibbling groggily at the ridge just before the escarpment, the corporal shrieked, Ah! It's got me! The senator grabbed the corporal's head for balance and grumbled, It's me, you idiot! The senator toppled to the ground and reared away from the sleeping bear. The corporal did a double take and asked sharply, Are we leaving yet? I can make it without help. Pointing to the bear, he continued, But what about him? December 10th. Moments later, the corporal stormed past Dogbert and the rabbit. He nearly bumped his head on the lockbox. Turning around, he snapped, Don't ask. Dogbert and the rabbit looked at each other, dumbfounded, and shrugged. Then they looked backward to see the senator slugging towards them with the bear sprawled over his shoulder. He dropped the bear at Dogbert's feet and smiled goofily. Here, I brought you a prezi. Dogbert squeezed his temples fitfully and stared directly into the sun. The sound of, a, of sizzling bacon radiated from the skull. After a long pause, he looked at the senator and said, What? I'm not hungry. He stared at the senator for a long time. Finally, he gasped, All right, he can come with us, but you carry him. The bear battered its eyes and looked up. I don't want to be your beast of burden. December 12th. Movie slogans that didn't make it. Enchanted. Disney's way of saying that it's okay for cartoon characters to be played by real people. Love in the time of cholera. She. How long will you love me? He. Until they find a cure for cholera. Sweeney Todd. Because Tim Burton just can't get over how good Johnny Depp looks in the Edward Scissorhands makeup. Enchanted. Michael Eisner ran into my office one day and asked, The cartoonist just ran out of ink. What do we do? B-movie, because B-reality makes for great romantic humor. December 14th and December 15th. The senator snarled at Dogbert. That Langolier thing is beginning to wake up. We need to get away from it. Dogbert folded his arms and looked down scornfully. He mused comically, tsk, 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 why do I have to explain things to you? The rabbit ran ahead, encouraging Dogbert in the center. Come on, let's go. 
Find that castle. The senator picked up the bear and turned to follow the rabbit. The bear muttered, I'm feeling much better now. I think I'll go for a walk. Suddenly there was, they were standing in the middle of the Sahara Desert. The rabbit did a double take. How are we supposed to find that castle now? Dogbert scoffed. We have to know which castle we are looking for in order to find it. The rabbit turned around again and retorted, We have to be looking at a castle in order to know that it's not the one we're looking for. December 17th, the rabbit reached down and picked up a handful of sand. Do you know what this is? He allowed the sand to sift through his, between his paws. It's sand. Do you know what it's going to be in a million years? He suddenly dropped the handful of sand and looked around in amazement. Sorry, I was just channeling Sam Kittison there for a moment. The senator stood straight and shouted, You are nuts. NVTS nuts. Sorry, I was just channeling Mel Brooks there. Dogbert stood up and remained, um... Mel Brooks isn't dead yet. December 18th. The rabbit chided Dogbert, Let's go to where the castles are so we can find the castle we are looking for. The platypus interjected, Well, we're not in France. Dogbert turned around suddenly. King Arthur was never in France. The rabbit chuckled, He may not have known that. After all, this is a python-esque King Arthur. The slug wafted down towards the dunes. Nothing but sand here. There's not even any cactuses or tumbleweeds. It sure isn't the western U.S. here. The bridge keeper looked around at the horizon. There's not even a Hallmark store in sight. The bird plopped down into the sand. Here's an idea. Let's make sand angels. The mountain glanced up at the slug and shouted, Hey, that's discrimination. December 19th. Dogbert scratched his chin thoughtfully. The holidays are a time for reflection. The mountain spoke up help helpfully, which explains why Windex is such an excellent stocking stuffer. Dogbert looked down at the ground in despair and then exhaled dismissively. He held out his paws in an embracing, embracing gesture. This holiday season, give the gift of presence of mind. The rabbit chuckled, because absent-mindedness is far less memorable. I'm trying to give a heartwarming spiritual holiday message here, Dogbert fumed. The bird and the platypus struggled with cogitation, scratching their foreheads in thought. Finally, they looked at each other and shrugged. The rabbit stepped forward and shouted, Meretricious! December 27th. At Pandemonium's kitchen, the bill staggered around on the table like a flag collapsing under an inconstant wind. Ugh! My stomach is speaking a foreign language. A tiny burp escaped its lips. The swamp leaned forward in concern. The Lord of Swamp Castle stood up and moved away from the table. The swamp looked up. Where are you going? The Lord of Swamp Castle moved dismissively, waved dismissively and remarked, My bladder is speaking to me in a language I understand all too well. He strolled quickly into the foyer and out the front door. At the Sahara Desert, Dogbert was reading a piece of paper. The rabbit leaned closer and asked, What's that? Dogbert studied the paper carefully. It says that we are to introduce a new character. The slug wafted downward. How exciting! Who is it now? Dogbert furrowed his brow. It says, Insert elaborate description here. In square brackets. December 28th. Dogbert continued, And then the salad dressing told the homeowner, I can't go back to the, in the refrigerator. The potatoes have eyes. The rabbit howled boisterously while the senator and the corporal slapped their knees while chuckling, chuckling loudly. The slug merely draft, drift, drifted upward in concern. Why do we have to create the new character? It must be the writer's strike, Dogbert replied. The slug scanned the ground and pondered, how Pirandellian. It's kind of like being Jay Leno, the rabbit suggested. P.S. Luigi Pirandello's play Six Characters in Search of an Author caused riots in Italy when it premiered in 1923. December 31st. Dogbert held up his paw. Now, we need to create this character. What should it be like? The rabbit spoke up. I want it to be sane. Dogbert replied, You mean, not like you? The rabbit nodded. Dogbert replied, Okay, not nutty. Anything else? The corporal raised its hand. I want it to be nice and polite. You know, even-handed and fair. Dogbert flipped the paper over and began writing. Hmm, not naughty. Got it. He pointed to the slug. And you? The slug wafted closer to the ground. I want it not to have a gnarly trunk. Dogbert held his pencil back in alarm. But elephants don't have gnarly trunks. The slug jolted up. 
Whoever said that I wanted it to be an elephant? Dogbert resumed writing. Okay, not naughty. January 3rd. With dazzling special effects and thoughtfully choreographed pratfalls, the entire group were transported back to England and dumped on the ground about 45 yards away from a castle. Dogbert stood quickly and scanned the ground, sniffing it nervously. The platypus sat up, rubbing its beak in pain, and muttered, Are you okay? The slug pried its wings from the branches of a nearby tree and fluttered over to the group. I don't see the mountain. Where is the mountain? The rabbit stood up, brushing debris out of its fur. How can you not see the mountain? The only way you could fail to see the mountain is if it's... The rabbit looked around, scanning the horizon. Disjointedly, he continued, It's like Mount Everest. It's huge. How can I not see it? The platypus looked around. Hey, look, there's a castle here. None of the others heard him. The slug began to sob quietly while turning and starting, fearfully hoping that the mountain might just appear upon a second look. January 5th. The slug began to weep. I need some tissues. Dogbert held up a box of Kleenex. Here, he looked up in dismay. How could the mountain have disappeared? The corporal raised his hand meekly and suggested, Maybe it was eroded away by a sandstorm. Dogbert dropped the box of Kleenex and grimaced. Don't you think that would take a few million years? The senator stepped up and offered, Maybe it fell into the ocean and dissolved in the salt water. The top of Dogbert's head turned red and began steaming. The rabbit raised a paw and suggested, Maybe it erupted and spewed its insides into the upper atmosphere, like Krakatoa. That would explain the change in temperature. Dogbert turned around sharply. We were just transported a few thousand miles north from a desert. It was already colder here. Dick Dastardly timidly raised his hand. Maybe it was kidnapped. All eyes were suddenly on Dick Dastardly's cringing face. Dick Dastardly explained, It's what I would do. Dogbert fumed, That's kinda anticlimactic, don't you think? The slug wafted down towards Dogbert, wailing inconsolably, I need more tissues. Dogbert jerked upward and shouted, Don't you have enough issues? The slug bellowed, I said tissues. The platypus pointed towards the castle. Maybe they could help us. January 10th. A familiar crunching sound could be heard faintly, could be faintly heard from the horizon. Dogbert looked around in a panic. The Langoliers are back. Slug, what do I do? The slug glanced around and said, You've got to look beyond that. Dogbert spun around in a panic and shouted, Hey, look, a castle. <laughs> the platypus slapped itself in the face in dismay. Dogbert continued, Okay, gang, we're going to storm that castle. The slug looked up fearfully. Is it going to rain? Dogbert pointed at the rabbit commandingly. Rabbit, you run up to the edge of the moat and order them to lower the drawbridge. Then order them to raise it again so you can step back a few feet and order them to lower it again. Platypus, you jump into the moat and fend off the crocagators. The platypus turned aside and asked, The what? Dogbert scoffed. I don't know which they are. I just know that they have big pointy teeth. The platypus stepped backward. And platypuses have none? January 14th. Dogbert pondered the situation. Well, I suppose we could just go up and knock on the portcullis and hope they invite us in. The senator frowned and retorted, Nah, that would make perfect sense. The rabbit shrugged and unthinkingly ran towards the moat, while the platypus cowered behind Dick Dastardly. The slug scanned the horizon, searching for any evidence of the mountain. Dogbert scratched behind his ear and replied, Yeah, not very nutty if you ask me. A voice behind Dogbert spoke up. Did you say my name? As the rabbit approached, the drawbridge chugged down, landing squarely on the rabbit's head and bouncing noisily as it pummeled his feet into the soil. Dogbert looked up. Ah, it's a cloud-shaped unicorn. Uh, acorn. The birds landed on the ground and studied the figure closely. Or an acorn-shaped cloud that's not very naughty. The platypus stepped closer. What are you? The figure waved gingerly and said, When they said elaborate, you must have been thinking of something else. January 16th. Dogbert stepped towards the mysterious figure commandingly. So if you're not as elaborate as you would like, who are you? The figure moved indescribably as though trying to invite, imitate a shrug. I'm a famous private investigator. Dogbert stepped back. I've never heard of you. The figure rose up proudly. Yes, I'm that good. The senator patted down his hair and held up his hand. I think that what Dogbert is asking is, are you competent? The figure wobbled forward. 
My reputation precedes me. You've never heard of me. Isn't that proof of my confident competence as a private investigator? The platypus rubbed its beak and looked up. You seem to be very fond of repeating yourself. I'm trying not to be elusive. The corpor corporal smiled. Dick dastardly watched the corporal and then said, That's not at all naughty. January 21st. The rabbit pried itself out from under the drawbridge and sprawled out on, on the grass beside it, gasping for breath. Dogbert edged towards the open drawbridge, calling, Hey, let's go, gang. The Langlers are after us again, and we're not safe here. Dick dastardly held up his hand cautiously. Wait, your new character lacks substance. The senator eyed the indescribable figure curiously. He's right. The new character is underdeveloped. The figure replied, I'm not very personified, if you ask me. Here, stick your hand in me. The senator grimaced and tentatively pushed his hand into the darkened mass. He quickly re retracted it, glancing around nervously. The figure grinned knowingly. Did you feel a spine-tingling sensation? The senator gulped. There is nothing in there. How does your nervous system function? I'm brainless, the figure quipped. The slug drifted closer. And to think that I had an inferior inferiority complex about not having a brain the size of a walnut. Dogbert strolled closer to the group hesitantly. It's only a complex if it's untrue. The figure focused on the slug and asked, You don't have the brain, a brain the size of the walnut? Nope, too big. It would cramp my eye stock muscles and make me talk funny. January 23rd. Dogbert stepped up to the indescribable figure. So, you're a private investigator. Why are you here? I am here to help you hunt, find your friend, the indescribable figure answered. And like Sherlock Holmes, I shall apply the 7% solution. The corporal raised his hand. Wait, that's a drug reference. We can't have that here. The indescribable figure shrank in fear. That's not what I was saying. What I meant was that I will be right about 7% of the time. The slug drifted away. That's so reassuring. The indescribable figure spun thoughtfully. What does your friend look like? The lockbox floated forward and said, Oh, about 30,000 feet tall. His profile kind of resembles Mount McKinley. The indescribable figure brightened up. Ah, a Rock Hudson lookalike. The lockbox rose up defensively. Uh, no, our friend is actually a mountain. The indescribable figure pondered for a moment. Hmm, you're right. Rock Hudson's profile looked more like Mount Rainier. The rabbit staggered up groggily. Okay, the drawbridge is open. Hey, platypus, how's it coming with those crocagators? The platypus cowered behind a nearby tree. January 24th. The indescribable figure announced, We need to look for clues. Does anybody have the phone number for Scooby and the gang? Dogbert laughed heartily. We don't need their help. We just need to retrace our steps to the last place one of us remembers seeing the mountain. Where were you when you last saw the mountain? Um, we were in the Sahara Desert, the lockbox answered. The indescribable figure emitted a sound of puzzlement. Hmm, how did you get here then? Mutley snickered fiendishly. January 25th. A dazzling array of light surrounded the group, and instantly they found themselves in the Sahara Desert again. Dogbert stood up, brushed the sand out of his fur, and looked around. The indescribable figure wobbled precariously and asked, I think I'm going to be airsick. The slug popped up out of a nearby sand dune and fluttered over. You should learn to get over that. You're an airborne critter, you know. The slug slowly scanned the horizon. I don't see the mountain here either. I'm starting to go from being worried to freaking out. I hope everything is okay. The indescribable figure looked down at the sand. If the mountain was here, then there must be footprints that would lead us on its trail. Dogbert put his paws on his hips and scowled angrily. We could be standing in one of his footprints and not know it. The platypus hung his, its head in despair. I wonder if we'll ever find that castle again. It could have been the one we were looking for. Dogbert shrugged. Ah, it's just as well. The Langler probably won't eat us. I've heard that senators taste foul. The bird alighted on the sand next to Dogbert. Hey, mock me or denigrate me, but don't ever compare me to a politician. Dogbert waved the bird off, then trudged towards the indescribable figure decisively. Well, I suppose the only thing to do from here is go back to the Bridge of Death. If it's still there. January 28th. The lockbox looked around. The rabbit waited hesitantly. Dogbert looked at the indescribable figure apologetically. I 
don't know how we got to the Sahara Desert from the Bridge of Death. We were suddenly just here. Motley snickered fiendishly. The slug drifted close to Dogbert's head. We teleported here. Don't you remember the dazzling special effects? Dogbert looked at, down at the ground. I thought that was the Aurora Borealis. Motley snickered, snickered fiendishly again. Dick dastardly scowled and glanced from Dogbert to Motley. Give me the remote, you mangy mutt. Motley reached behind into his thick fur and pulled out a small device. Rasso, 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 rasso. Dick dastardly took the device and pushed a button on it. The bear flinched and covered its eyes. The lockbox dropped to the ground, digging into the sand with a hollow thud. Dogbert glanced around, waiting for the dazzling special effects to overtake the vast emptiness around him. The indescribable figure waited tentatively, calmly. The senator tensed, squinting his eyes against the annoying roller coaster ride that would lead him to the bridge of death. But nothing happened. He opened his eyes slowly and glanced precariously from side to side. Dick dastardly whacked Mutley on the top of the head angrily. This silly thing doesn't work. Mutley, you broke it. Mutley shrugged in innocently and smiled sheepishly. Dogbert stepped up, trying not to laugh. Which button did you press? Dick dastardly looked down at the rope and moved his finger away from the button he had pressed. It had pressed. It says Hugh, but nothing happened, did it? Mutley guffawed loudly and pounded on the ground in amusement. Dogbert smirked and observed, That would explain the bright green complexion you have now. January 31st. Beetlejuice stepped up to Dick Dastardly, rubbing his palms rudely on his waistcoat. I think it looks good on you. The green in your face nicely contrasts the dull purple of your trench coat, but really complements that silly engineer's hat you're wearing. Dick Dastardly folded his arms in contempt and looked away. February 1st. Dick Dastardly slyly pressed the hue button again. His face turned beet red. Mutley looked up at him and began snickering again. Dick Dastardly grimaced and then held out the remote control, pressing the hue button again. His face turned royal blue. I'm glad this thing doesn't have an Irish dance button. He pressed the hue button again. His face returned to its normal peach-toned color. The slug flew upward, saying, I think I'll look for clues somewhere else. Dogbert shouted up at the sky, But wait, we're going to the Bridge of Death for that. The slug turned back. We should separate and look for clues in different places. That never worked for Fred and the Scooby gang, Dogbert report, retorted. The platypus reached down and picked up a piece of paper. Hey, look, what's this? Dogbert waved his fist in the air. The platypus grabbed Dogbert's arm and showed him the piece of paper. Dick dastardly pressed the teleport button and disappeared in a cloud of smoke. February 3rd. Dogbert pulled his arm away from the platypus's grip and stared aghast at the space where Dick Dastardly had been standing. After a moment, Dick Dastardly flashed back, his feet still standing in the footprints he'd created. Hey, this is cool. I was just at the... Dick Dastardly blinked out of the space again. Dogbert looked around at the rabbit and the bird angrily. Dick Dastardly flashed back into the space again. Stop that, Dogbert shouted. The indescribable figure drafted backward warily. Dick Dastardly blinked away again. Dogbert growled as the fur on his back rose up. Flash, I blink. Stay here this time. Flash, wasn't blink. Give me that thing. Flash, done, blink. Stop fooling around. Flash, talking yet. Come here, you. Dogbert lunged at Dick Dastardly's torso. Blink. Dogbert landed on the sound with a thwump. February 4th. In metrics, I am reporting zero days out of RSLA and no history. Lockbox Recon is still zero days out of its SLA. Lockbox History Recon is 43 days out of current. GL-1003 Recon is still fighting with a division by zero error. UAC RAR balances are inactive. XXX thousand XXX dollars. Suspense XXX thousand XXX dollars. February 5th. In metrics I am reporting zero days out of our SLA and no history. Lockbox Recon is still zero days out of its SLA. Lockbox History, history Recon is still 41 days out of current. GL-1003 Recon is still fighting with the division by zero error. UAC RAR balances are inactive, XXX thousand XXX dollars. Suspense, XXX thousand XXX dollars. Dick Dastardly flashed back, turning his heels in the sand to widen his footprints. He staggered wildly, reaching out for support. Yow! My cochleas are carbonated. 
The others edged backward nervously. Dogbert scooted away alongside the lockbox. Dick dastardly glanced down at his feet. Where is Dogbert? He was standing right in front of me. He continued to flail. Would somebody put my center of gravity back under my feet where it belongs? The bridge keeper moved sideways slightly and asked the rabbit, Is this the Irish dance button? Because I remember Irish dancing to be much more organized than this. Dick dastardly fell off his feet and stood uncertainly again. Would you guys please be still? The rabbit stood up tenderly. We're not moving. Dick dastardly fell again and decided to stay on the ground. February 6th. In metrics, I am reporting zero days out of our SLA and no history. Lockbox Recon is still zero days out of its SLA. Lockbox History Recon is still 40 days out of current. GL-1003 Recon is still fighting with the division by zero error. UAC RAR balances are inactive, XXX thousand, XXX dollars. Suspense, XXX thousand, XXX dollars. February 7th. From Senior Finance Manager regarding one of the UAC accounts. Please relabel the suspense account to be un be titled Government Holding Account. Thanks. February 7th. Reply to Senior Finance Manager regarding one of the UAC accounts. Ah, thank you. Being suspenseful was getting tired, narratively speaking. February 7th. In metrics, I'm reporting zero days out of our SLA and no history. Rock Lockbox Recon is still zero days out of its SLA. Lockbox History Recon is still 38 days out of current. GL-1003 Recon is still fighting with the division by zero error. UAC RAR balances are inactive, XXX thousand, XXX. Government holding, XXX thousand, XXX dollars. The slug's, the slug's wing suddenly disappeared and it fell to the ground with a thud. Ugh. Dick Dastardly continued to wobble around. I feel like an old Led Zeppelin song. He dropped the remote. Which one? The slug tried to crawl through the sound. I'm getting all crusty. Dick Dastardly raised one foot and spun around uncertainly. He fell down, landing on the remote with a thump. Ugh. A portion of the sky suddenly lit up like a movie screen. In the picture, Sam Lowry nervously sneaked across the middle of a lobby. He approached a large stone desk and asked, Excuse me, Dorson, could you put me through to Mr. Helpman's office, please? Dorson looked up insolently. I'm afraid I can't, sir. You'll have to go through the proper channels. Sam Lowry headed nervously. And you can't tell me what those channels are because that's classified, right? Dorson returned his attention to the idle executive toy he'd been playing with. I'm glad to see the minister is continuing his tradition of recruiting the brightest and best, sir. Sam Lowry dejectedly strolled away towards the elevators. Dogbert looked around in confusion. Ugh, what's that supposed to mean, you concussive fool? I don't know, Dick dastardly shrugged. I just sat on it. Mutley snickered fiendishly. Dogbert lurched towards Dick dastardly. Give me that remote. Dick dastardly tossed it away. Go get it, Lycos. Dogbert rested his forepaws on his hips and tapped his hind paw impatiently. I'm not laughing. Mutley twitched and then resisted the urge to chase it. Dick dastardly stood up calmly and waited insolently. Dogbert continued to tap his hind paw impatiently. I'm still not laughing. The slug lunged through the sand slowly. Ow! It itches! The rabbit darted off to get the remote. The slug wailed loudly. It's so gritty! February 9th. Dogbert chased, charged after the rabbit. You leave that remote control alone. Approaching the spot where the remote landed, the, dog bird, the rabbit landed, dove into the sand, causing a cloud of dust to rise from the dune. Dogbert sailed into the cloud after him. The lockbox shrugged and looked up at the indescribable figure apologetically. Sorry, they're fight frightfully competitive. The platypus watched despondently as Dogbert and the rabbit wrestled in the sand. Hey guys, are we forgetting that we still have to rescue the mountain? Ignoring the platypus's question, Dogbert and the rabbit continued to kick, push, and shove each other away from the remote. Suddenly there was a cracking sound from under the rabbit's hip. Both of them immediately became motionless, each glaring into the other's eyes. Dogbert finally shouted, Now look what you've done! Moments later, the familiar crunching sound of approaching Langoliers rang out from the horizon. The lockbox looked around nervously. Say, who's hungry? I could go for a pizza. February 13th. Dogbert looked, picked up the remote and stood up. He pointed it towards Dick Dastardly and pressed a button. 
Dick dastardly began hopping rhythmically while marching daintily. What's going on? The rabbit stood up, brushed the sound out of his fur, sand out of his fur, and looked over Dogbert's shoulder. Hey, try that one. Dogbert pressed the button that the rabbit had indicated, had pointed out. Gee, maybe it's not broken. Dick dastardly folded his arms and began squatting and kicking his legs while continuing to hop rhythmically. Which one is this? Cossack dance? It doesn't have a tango button, does it? Dogbert chuckled for a bit and then pressed another button. Dick dastardly fell to his knees in a heap and gasped for air. I feel like I've been line dancing with Angus Young. The rabbit grinned at Dogbert. This is fun. The indescribable figure moved towards Dogbert and the rabbit. Please try to remember that he has a concussion. February 14th. The rabbit grabbed the top of the remote and began to tug aggressively. Dogbert tightened his grip and pulled the remote closer to his body. The indescribable figure wafted towards the lockbox. This isn't very conducive to our investigative efforts. The lockbox looked up and sneered. Give it time. It grows on you. The rabbit tugged at Dogbert's ear painfully. Dogbert raised his free paw and swatted the rabbit's snout. The indescribable figure floated across the dunes towards Dogbert and the rabbit. Stop it! Dogbert and the rabbit paused simultaneously, looking up at the indescribable figure for a moment. Then they resumed their struggles over the remote. The lockbox floated over beside the indescribable figure tentatively. The indescribable figure whispered, What can I do? What should I say? The lockbox leaned over and replied, You've got to tr get them to trust each other. The indescribable figure leaned towards Dogbert. Since you are claiming to be in a leadership capacity, you need to tell the rabbit to trust himself. A dense black question mark popped into existence above Dogbert's head and puffed away in a cloud of black vapor. February 15th. Still keeping a tight grip on the remote, Dogbert turned to the rabbit and said, Trust yourself. The rabbit did a double take and stared at Dogbert in alarm. What? I can't trust myself. I'm a crazy rabbit. The rabbit looked from side to side nervously and then stared fiercely at Dogbert. Do you want to trust me? Dogbert balked. The indescribable figure moved upward, looking at the others. Do any of you want to trust the rabbit? A dense black exclamation point appeared suddenly above Dogbert's head, then puffed away in a cloud of black vapor. The senator looked down, whistling nervously. The corporal scuffed at the sand with his toes. The bird cast an imploring glance at the platypus, who shrugged helplessly and turned away. The indescribable figure watched in growing concern. Oh, come on! Do any of you think the rabbit is trustworthy? The corporal suppressed a snicker, but struggled to keep his face hidden. The indescribable figure rose up higher. Everyone deserves to be trusted. Don't any of you find the rabbit trustable? The corporal finally burst out with a guffaw and covered his mouth. Muttley stomped on the corporal's foot while the senator elbowed him in the ribs and muttered, Lummox! Waiting for a response, the indescribable figure drooped in a growing sadness. The lockbox drifted closer. The indescribable figure backed away in dismay. Uh, I'm not too comfortable with this sounding like an idiot in order to get my point across thing. The black box moved even closer. But you're such a natural. February 21st. Dogbert jerked the remote out of the rabbit's grip and turned to the others. Now, we need to stop fooling around and find that castle. Blangoliers are still after us and there is nowhere safe to hide here. He held up the remote and moved the paw over the teleport button. The platypus raised his paw tentatively and suggested, Hey, wait, what about this card? Dogbert lowered the remote and stepped over to the platypus. What card? The platypus handed the piece of paper to Dogbert and said, I found it in the sand when we got here. It says cable lock, whatever that means. Dogbert looked up at Dick Dastardly, who was waving, wavering uncertainly. I'm getting really thirsty. The slug crawled up. It could be. It would be really nice to see a mirage. Dogbert looked down scornfully. But mirages are imaginary. What good would hallucinating do? The slug looked up, spitting sand before speaking. Well, since we're all extended metaphors, an imaginary glade would be real to us. Dogbert hastily pressed the teleport button. February 22nd. The now familiar dazzling special effects were followed by a deafening crunching sound as the group was deposited into the muck surrounding Swamp Castle. Dick dastardly stumbled and lay fast, face down in the mud. The senator pulled him up and looked down at him. Better press that hue button again, Dogbert. He's looking pretty green around the gills. 
Dogbert smacked the remote into Platypus's face. This is the wrong castle. Where are we supposed to be? Muttley struggled to pull his feet out of the mire. Arg! The slug settled happily in the oozing slime and moaned grief gleefully. Ah, I could call this place home. A fretful gurgling sound rang out above the roar of the crunching langoliers. The slug turned suddenly but snapped an alarm. I thought I heard something familiar, but I must be hallucinating now. The lockbox wafted downward closer to the slug. You look like you've just seen a ghost. The slug glanced up and then scanned the horizon fitfully. But I don't see him here. Dogbert pressed the teleport button again. Whirling through a non-particulate dimension, Dogbert and the others flailed haplessly against the torrential gusts. The bear growled horrifically. The bird whispered, I feel like that strip, ship, the Rosinante in the story you told earlier. With a whump, they all fell on a heap on the ground about 45, years away, 45 yards away from a familiar castle. The crunching sound of the langoliers was pervasive, like the hissing roar of heavy rain on pavement. Dogbert stood up, brushing dirt and grass blades out of his fur. We need to hurry, he shouted. The langoliers are almost upon us, and if this is the wrong castle, we will need to keep teleporting until we find it. Dick dastardly groaned in disgust, grass grasping his belly to keep it from expressing itself more fully. As the others stood up, wiping away the dirt, the slug pried itself from the strands of a spider web in a nearby tree. Why am I always the one getting stuck when we travel this way? Dogbert galloped towards the castle, and instructing over his shoulder as he ran. Remember, we're in a different time, so speak in terms that these people can understand. We should speak in the vernacular, the rabbit added. The senator stopped and retorted, We can't speak in the vernacular. The vernacular is laced with profanity. Ignoring them, Dogbert raced into the open portcullis. February 27th. The rabbit raced into the castle after Dogbert, followed by the slug, the platypus, and the lockbox. Dogbert halted in the center of the courtyard, looking around. We need to do something that's in the movie in order to get... Back in sync with our timeline. Dogbert shouted above the din of the langoliers. The rabbit held up his paw. I've seen this movie about 167 times. Beetlejuice stepped up and continued, And it keeps getting funnier every time I see it. Dogbert looked quizzically at the rabbit. The rabbit beckoned the others into the courtyard and announced, I know just what to do. He darted towards the stairwell and clambered up the steps. Dogbert and Dick Dastardly followed doggedly while the others looked around in confusion. As they neared the top of the stairs, an unfamiliar voice called out, Say, you think you could out-clever... So, you think you could out-clever us French folk with your silly knees bent running around advancing behavior? The rabbit hurried to the corner of the roof while Dick Dastardly leaned against the wall. Dogbert stumbled forward, holding out his paws in ignorance. Far below, outside the castle walls, a more familiar voice called out, If you do not open this door, we shall take this castle by force. Grab that bucket, the rabbit ordered. Dogbert darted past Dick Dastardly, pushing him out of the way rudely. Ugh! Dick Dastardly leaned over the wall and jerked fitfully. Splat! Dogbert picked up the bucket and looked at the rabbit. What do I do now? Dick Dastardly made a sickening coughing sound as he jerked again. Splat! The deafening roar of the si langoliers was suddenly silenced. The rabbit looked down over the wall to see King Arthur trudging down the steps while exclaiming, Right, that settles it. The rabbit put a paw over the bucket and told Dogbert, Problem solved. The lockbox floated up beside Dogbert and looked at the rabbit scornfully. You made him barf on the king of the Britons? Arthur, son of Uther Pendragon, the legendary king who united the Anglo-Saxon tribes into what would become the greatest empire in history, and you made Dick Dastardly barf on him? The rabbit grinned smugly. Well, it worked. March 5th. The platypus, the bird, and the lockbox slept comfortably, leaning against a rock outside the castle. The slug had crawled underneath a rock and was slumbering in the mossy undergrowth. Dick Dastardly and the rabbit lay sprawled out in the open field nearby. Mutley was curled up between them, snoozing lightly. Dogbert slept reclining on the other side of a nearby tree. The indescribable figure hovered watchfully over the tree's canopy. Dogbert stirred, slightly rubbing his closed eyes groggily. Dilbert, I had the strangest dream. There was this group of inept extended metaphors who, had, who needed to go to England and cross this bread of death thing 
as a rite of passage, and there was a wacky rabbit messing with me, and an iron cube with a keyhole and barred windows and a flying slug. He stood up and turned around, lowering his paws as he opened his eyes. Ah! It wasn't a dream. He turned around quickly, looking at the ground. He closed his eyes tightly and muttered to himself, If I close my eyes, maybe they'll just forget that I'm here and go on their merry way. He opened his eyes and looked over his shoulder. Dagnabbit, they're still asleep. I should have remembered the advice of Baba O'Reilly. March 7th. The indescribable figure drooped down to Dogbert. Quick, now's your chance to escape. Nobody's watching. Dogbert frowned sadly and looked up. What would you say? The indescribable figure looked around furtively. I'll make something up. They'll believe me. They're gullible. Dogbert stomped over to the rabbit and kicked him soundly in the rump. Ow! The rabbit jumped up and shouted. What was that for? Muttley popped up, raising his ears in alarm. Dogbert fumed silently. The indescribable figure shrugged. Well, I guess that saves me the trouble of covering for you. Dick Dastardly rolled fitfully and stretched. Ow! Muttley, you miserable mongrel. I had the weirdest dream. Dogbert stepped over beside Dick Dastardly and stood over him, bristling angrily. Dick Dastardly froze, moved his mouth to speak again, froze again, and looked at Dogbert finally. Fearfully. Finally, he muttered, Under redundant, it says, see redundant. March 10th. Dogbert jogged into the castle courtyard while the indescribable figure woke up the bird in the lockbox. Dick, da Dick Dastardly, Muttley, and the rabbit followed Dogbert. The courtyard was bustling with activity. Peasants were skirting to and fro, rummaging through everything, from baskets to barrels, horse carts, and hay bales. A princely man stood in the center of the courtyard, raging visibly. Where's my wooby? he shouted. I want my wooby. The lockbox woke up the senator and the corporal, while the bird pecked frenetically at the rock to wake up the slug. The bear snored loudly, his lips flapping blubberously at each exhale. The prince stomped over to a man who was searching in produce, produce baskets the market cart. What are you doing? The man raised his hands timidly and answered, I'm searching for your wooby, your highness, just as you ordered. The man resumed flip, flapping, flipping the fruits and vegetables while looking under them. The prince waved his arms across the courtyard magnanimously. I want you to search everywhere. Leave no stone unturned. The prince looked down at the man again. Why are you doing what I have told you to do while I am telling you what to do? A little girl holding a scrappy doll walked meekly towards the indescribable figure and began to sing. Twinkle, twinkle, little star, how I wonder what... Dogbert stomped the ground near her feet and shouted, Stop that! March 11th, the little girl shrieked and began to cry. Dogbert cautiously raised his paws and attempted to calm the girl while shushing her gently. The rabbit glanced at Dogbert in alarm and then allowed his eyes to fall on the, little, on the little girl curiously. A light bulb appeared over the rabbit's head and then exploded, raining a shower of glass over the rabbit's ears, followed by the brass socket bouncing clumsily off his crown. Dogbert, he shouted, I have an idea. Dogbert turned to the rabbit as the little girl ran off towards the portcullis. The rabbit stepped up courageously. We should convince the prince the mountain has stolen his wooby. That way he'll send soldiers to find the mountain for the return of his most prized possession. Dogbert rubbed his chin and thought. That would be a fine idea, except the part where the prince throws the mountain into the dungeon when he finds him. Dogbert looked expectantly at the rabbit, waiting. You have a screw loose, rabbit. The rabbit did a double take. No, I don't. I may have a couple of screws in a bit too tight, but I'm not daffy. Dogbert listened attentively and thought about the rabbit's idea. He looked at the rabbit for a long time. Finally, he looked up and said, Yes, you are. March 19th. The prince walked across the courtyard towards Dogbert and the rabbit, pointing an accusatory finger at them. Dogbert rested his paw on the rabbit's shoulder and admonished him. Remember, I'm in charge. Let me do the talking. The rabbit did a table double take. Do you think he'll be any less suspicious of a talking dog wearing glasses than a talking rabbit? Dogbert slapped the rabbit and whispered harshly, I'm holding a coffee cup in my hand. The rabbit looked down at Dogbert's paws and stared quizzically at the empty coffee cup. What are you going to do? Mimic your best Bogart and ask for alms? The prince advanced on Dogbert and the rabbit, shouting, You two, what are you doing here? Dogbert bent his knees humbly. Your Majesty, could you be so kind as to tell me the name of this castle? The prince looked around bemusedly, as though unable to comprehend how his castle's name could not be self-evident from its appearance. 
This is my humble abode, the castle Arg. May I bid you welcome? Dogbert began shaking nervously and held his coffee cup towards the prince. The prince looked at the proffered coffee cup and then returned his gaze to Dogbert's eyes. You know, when I was a child, my father the king would teach me anecdotes of his father the former king. One of them was, a day that doesn't start with a cup of coffee hasn't started yet. Dogbert gnashed his teeth noisily and retorted, a day without coffee is like... Dot, dot, dot. Well, I don't know what that would be like. March 21st. The pin prince peered into Dogbert's coffee cup early. Your coffee's getting cold and lonely, he said. Dogbert turned the cup, coffee cup so that he could see inside it and remarked, It's a little stale. Unable to contain his sense of urgency, the rabbit stepped in front of Dogbert and blurted, The mountain stole your wooby. The prince did a double take. Dogbert leaned backwards, partly in surprise and partly in anger. A dense black semicolon appeared suddenly above Dogbert's head, then puffed away in a cloud of black vapor. The prince peered at the space above Dogbert's head in confusion. Dogbert sheepishly twiddled his paws and stammered, I don't know him. The prince looked up and waved the guards over. Put this dog and rabbit in the kennels. Then go to the stables and bring me my horse. As he trudged back towards the palace doors, he noticed Dick Dastardly and Mutley standing below the indescribable figure. Can you ride a horse? Dick Dastardly waved meekly, nodded slightly, and looked down at Mudley. I think he was talking to you. He glanced dejectedly up at the prince again, then turned to Mutley again. This is another fine mess you've gotten me into. As the guards led Dogbert and the rabbit into the kennels, the prince jogged towards the stables. At that moment, the bird succeeded in waking up the slug. Stepping over beside the platypus, the bird rubbed its beak scornfully while the slug climbed up the side of the rock. The slug groggily mumbled, Hey, Mountain, I had the weirdest dream. Finally, extending his eye stalks and opening its eyes, the slug saw the castle looming in front of it and muttered, Oh, I guess I should just go back to sleep then. Suddenly, a horse carrying the prince galloped loudly across the wooden drawbridge, but suddenly stumbled to a halt before the rock. The bird and the platypus stood motionless in a row. The senator rolled over and opened his eyes. Lummox! Dejectedly, the prince pulled on the rein sideways. The horse turned around and trudged back through the portcullis into the courtyard, stopping in front of the now-locked kennels. Dogbert stood inside the bars beside the rabbit, holding the coffee cup upside down and shaking it sadly. The prince asked, You don't even know where this mountain is, do you? The horse snorted sloppily. April 4th. The prince looked amusedly at Dogbert and the rabbit for a long time. The rabbit grabbed Dogbert's coffee cup and began to draw, drag it back and forth across the kennel's cage bars. Dogbert gasped and lunged at the rabbit, grabbing the coffee cup and holding it still. That's stoneware! You can't treat it like a tin cup! Watching, the prince chuckled and motioned to the ground, to the guard. Open it up, he ordered. The guard unlatched the kennel's gate and flung it aside. Dropping the coffee cup, the rabbit spun it out and dashed across the courtyard towards the open portcullis. Dogbert stayed inside the kennel, only reaching down to pick up his coffee cup out of the mud. The prince looked expectantly at Dogbert and uh, finally asked, Well? Dogbert looked up at the prince and answered, I'll be free now. The prince smirked and pushed the gate shut. He mounted his horse and trotted into the court out of view, courtyard out of view. After story drafts from June 16th, first entry, the prince led the horse... The prince led his horse away from the castle towards the highway and mused, We are entering a world of abstractions now. Nothing will be literal anymore. The slug looked up sharply. Has that ever been the case? The prince smirked as his horse tumbled along the buckles in the road. He scratched his chin. Things that are important will not persist for the mere fact that somebody's got to do them. It's all turning into Swiss cheese. And carrots, the rabbit hopped excitedly alongside the horse. I want there to be carrots in this world of abstractions. The prince looked down and snickered softly. Yes, there will also be carrots, he answered. Second entry. The slug glanced sightlessly from side to side. Well, then who's going to do the important stuff? The prince glared at the clouds. What a very sitcom-like thing to say. Who do you think they should do it? The slug pointed at its eye stalks. I would recommend those who don't exist. That way it doesn't have to be us. The prince stared at the ground suddenly. What makes you think you exist? 
Look, Mr. Falstaff, I've been traumatized by that problem quite enough. Thank you very much, and I don't sound, mind. I don't, and I don't like sounding like defensive Daffy Duck.